The legend ends. Someone is speaking on the podium. A lot of spectators have gathered. A red-haired girl sniper picks her victim. Her weapon is well equipped. It has good optics and a silencer. A young man enters the stage. This is Leonard Aaron Vandersteen, United Technocracy of Eurasia, member of the Joint Executive Council. There are drones circling him. The girl sniper saw the target, takes aim, fires a shot. A young man lies on the stage covered in blood. Security is on their way to him. Subject eliminated. The young men rush towards Leonard with horror on their faces. The girl screams for him to hold on. It's very horrible. The young man tells Maria to call an ambulance immediately. He holds Leonardo's hand. Leonard says he is relieved to die in the arms of those he loves. His soul is leaving his body. It seems he won't be able to fulfill their promise and see the world change with them. These crooks, instead of trying to solve the world's problems, simply ripped off those who believed in them. All this time they have been feeding on the spirit of the people and corrupting the youth. They poured the vitality of the country into wars and conquests. To satisfy their own greed, they did not care for the many orphans that resulted. He grew up in one of those overcrowded shelters, every night cuddling his empty belly and crying among the others until he fell asleep. Lying there, he asked himself why they should serve those who hurt them. Why should they fight for them, work for them, pay them and thank them? Shouldn't they be the ones helping them? Years went by. He studied hard, worked hard, and learned to lie through his teeth. To defeat the monsters, he became one of them. But instead of feeding on the weak, he vowed to protect them by devouring their predators. His childhood friends Brutus and Maria were the first to follow him. As time went on, others joined them and the number of his followers grew, as his oratorical skills grew. As his status grew, the corrupt invited him into their ranks. They thought he was just like them. By the time they realized the threat he posed, it was too late. The cobwebs were torn and people woke up. As a last resort, the tyrants hired an assassin. Who was to eliminate him? There was no way to avoid it. I guess it was fate's destiny. They think it will solidify their control over the world. But they're too late. It will only lead to its collapse. And a new order will rise from the ashes. They think they've won. But they've already lost. With his death, all his secret files on their corruption will be made public. People will go on to do what he couldn't. Leonard thanks Brutus and Maria for believing in him. Maria can't believe what's happened. She is sobbing. Brutus tries to comfort the girl. The ambulance staff carry Leonard away. A new legend begins. The sun has risen. Everyone is looking at the dawn. The bullet fired by the girl and the sniper pierces through Leonard's body. The young man falls. Brutus and Maria lean over the dying Leonard. The young man is bleeding. This blood will give first to a new dawn. The girl opened her eyes. There was terror in those eyes. Someone told Herm to wake up. It must have been a bad dream. A girl is asked if she is okay. The girl can't come to her senses. She is still scared. The young people are in a cave. The cave is poorly lit. The conditions they are in suggest that their lives are not easy. The boy screamed out of fear too. He doesn't understand anything. How he got here. It's a nightmare. At the same second, he received a fist to the head. The blow was very hard. He was frightened into silence. The girl told the young man if he screamed again, she would hit him even harder. He must understand that. The boy told his sister that he would keep quiet. The young man doesn't realize anything. It's not his body. Who is he? Where is he? Why did he call her his sister? So many questions appeared in his mind. A girl asks Herm what's wrong. He scares her. Should she call a healer? Something's starting to clear in the guy's head. Her name is Gorza, and he's her brother, Herm. Are they scarecrows? Goblinoids? Scarecrow. They're the weakest race. Even the goblins command them. They are intelligent, but that means little in this world. The young men are very frightened. They are huddled together. A tribe of Herma who found themselves in the midst of a war between the Jira goblins and the Kura kobolds. They were enslaved by the Jira and forced to work in the mines. Now tribe members are risking their lives. They work for a pittance in magical caves. These caves are haunted by monsters, magic ore and treasure. Created in the age of the gods, Herm and his sister the Greyborn, a type of Poogle with great magical talent. Despite being respected for their abilities in the past, the Greyborn once attempted to use their power to rule over other Pugils. Having failed in their coup, they were forbidden to use magic and their skills were lost over time. They are now the lowest of the low. Garbage among garbage. Herm realized it was a nightmare. It's all just a nightmare. They can't exist like this. 
There was complete hopelessness in Herm's eyes. The girl decided she'd better go to a healer. She couldn't do it on her own. The guy woke up and said he was fine. It was disrespectful of them to bother them for such a trivial matter. The girl agreed. But she asked him never to shout like that again. Otherwise, he might give her a seizure. The girl said it was time to get up. They had to go. Herm didn't understand where they needed to go and why they had to go. The young man hadn't quite come to his senses yet. Herm said he has been here long enough, but they have very little merit. He was almost dead when that tunnel collapsed. Thanks to V, she had enough credit to save him. The boy understood almost nothing of what his sister had just told him. What kind of merit we're talking about? To keep the Ciroborn under control, the Wardens use a merit for work system. Even if a Greyborn earns enough merit, he can only buy the worst quality necessities. The young man decided he was wrong. This wasn't a nightmare. He had clearly died and gone to hell. The girl was already standing on the threshold of the cave. She called out to her brother once more. What is he doing? Why isn't he coming? Herm stood with his eyes closed. He was trying to get out of this dream. He thought he was about to open his eyes and it would all disappear. Now it would all happen. The young man tried to count to three. The girl called out to him once more. She called her brother by name. The boy opened his eyes. Nothing had changed. This was reality. This was the new reality. All of it. The young man cried. He could not stop. His sister asked why he was crying. What was wrong? What was wrong with him? The young man yelled for the girl not to touch him. He didn't want to accept this reality. His body refused. His mind protested. How had he gotten here? The girl looked at her brother with consternation. What had happened to him? He's supposed to take care of her, and he's acting like this. The girl turned away sadly. She decided that she had no one to rely on. She would have to do it all by herself. Herm calmed down a little. He apologized to his sister. He was a little tired right now, and that would pass. He would pull himself together. A huge shadow appeared. A menacing voice sounded. Why are these brats still here? They've had enough of life. The girl looked at him in consternation. Not that. There was horror in her eyes. It was a feeling that constantly accompanied young people. It was a green, huge old man. He asked when these gray rascals would calm down. The goblin was angry. The girl obediently listened to him. The girl thought, why did Healer Rog come? Could he have heard his brother screaming? That's all they needed. The healer said these brats think his clinic is a hotel. Then he should charge them accordingly. The old man asked how much merit they had. He was angry. The young people tried to justify themselves. The girl wanted to explain that her brother was not feeling well. The young man respectfully called the healer a master. The guy stated that they were waiting for the healer because they wanted to express their deep gratitude to him. Without his great skill, he would be dead. He was very lucky that the master applied his knowledge to a lowly slave like him. The old man listened to all this with his eyes bulging. He hadn't expected to hear so much flattery. It calmed him down. The healer grinned. He could see the stones had put some common sense into the young man. That was commendable. The old man liked being called Master Healer. The young man continued. They stayed to present the master with this token of their appreciation. The young man held out the stones to the old man. The old man said it's hardly enough, but it'll do for now. Now they have to get out. He has other things to do. The young men said they were grateful to the great healer. The old man said if they had merit, they could come. Otherwise, let them not waste his time. The girl caught up with the young man. She asked what it was about. The young man told her what it was about. Sister said it was an act of gratitude and submission. The boy kissed that old man's wrinkled old ass more than the priestess of the magician. The young man replied that if he didn't, they would lose everything. The girl wants to eat this week. The sister agreed, but the brother had never been so humiliated before. The young man thought maybe the rocks had really knocked some sense into him, and he acted differently. The girl agreed, and now her brother seemed different. She decided to think about it later. Someone called out to Gorza and Herm. The young men looked back. It was a girl. She said she had finally found them, and she ran up to them. Gorza asked what was wrong, why the girl was not at work. She replied that Cool had sent her to warn the young men. Jurg and his buddies are looking for Herm. The girl was scared. Why they wanted her brother. What had happened again, Herm remembered. Jurg's brother was the one who caused the collapse, but he wants to blame it on Germ. That's probably true. The girl said it was like that. The overseers threw him into the punishment cave, and he told Jurg that Herm had caused the cave in. Gorza said it wasn't fair. Herm almost died himself. The girl stated that it could happen if Jurg found him. 
the girl said she had to go. It is not safe for young people to be. They need to not be seen. Herm wanted to tell Jurg everything he thought of him, but it was only his thoughts. The brother asked if they came home, they would be safe. They are, aren't they? The girl agreed. Their cave is right next to the overseers. There was no way they would cause them any trouble there. The young man stated, then their path should be as short as possible. However, it can be assumed that they will be searched for on direct routes. Maybe there is another way to get home. The girl said not really. There are forbidden caves, but no one should go through them alone. The kid said he's not going alone. He's going with his sister. And it would be safe. When you're in trouble, you should always take the more interesting path. That's what his old teacher used to say. His sister asked what old teacher he could be talking about. He had never told her about it before. The young man said it didn't matter. We should move home now. He asked his sister to show him the way. The young men began to move around the forbidden caves, but they were not alone. They were secretly being watched. Herm asked his sister why no one was allowed in here again. What else had happened? The sister replied that monsters sometimes come up this way from the lower levels. They need to be careful. The guy thought they used crystals in the main areas, but here the moss itself emits enough light to see. It's a fascinating sight, but it can't be used in the main caves because of the bad odor. The boy saw the boarded up entrances. He asked his sister what was in there. The girl said there were acid pits and we should stay away from them. Herm asked his sister if she had been here before. The girl replied that she had once come here with a work group to dump garbage in the pits. Something caught the girl's attention. She stopped. She looked cautiously in the direction the sounds were coming from. The young man stopped too. The girl clung to her brother. Startled, she called his name. What could it be? The young men looked up in fear. They opened their mouths in amazement. They had never seen such a thing. It was frightening. It was a huge red monster. There was someone's leg sticking out of its mouth. It was too late to run away. They froze. Needing to maintain silence, the girl clamped her hand over her mouth. The brother took his sister's hand. We have to get out of here somehow. The young men were unlucky. One of them accidentally stepped on an old bone. There was a crunch. It was enough to attract the monster's attention. The girl's eyes grew even wider with terror. She was panicking about what to do. Her first thought was to run away. The monster turned its attention to the young men. A part of a human being was peeking out of its mouth. There was blood dripping down its teeth. It was creepy. The monster turned around and headed towards the young men. They had become a new target for him. What to do now, Herm thought. The young men did not move. They held their breath. The monster's jaws were already in close proximity to the young man. The boy lowered his head. He didn't look up. He tried not to breathe. He could smell the foul odor coming from the monster's mouth. The monster didn't seem to notice the young man. He must be blind, the young man thought. The main thing is not to make a noise and keep quiet. This thing knows by sound or smell. The monster turned around. Something caught his attention in the other direction. Maybe this will save them, the boy thought. The young men pressed against each other. Herm signaled for silence. The girl covered her mouth with her hand. The young men quietly began to retreat. They tried to get away from the monster. The monster did not notice them. When they had moved a considerable distance away, the guy said, they seemed to break away. The girl said she thought they were finished. That's the detour, the young man said. You could say it was lucky. Borza said she didn't know of any other workarounds. She offered what she knew. The guy thought it was an offshoot of the main tunnel. We should check it out. The young man heard something. His ear caught a foreign sound. Herm asked his sister if she had heard anything. He couldn't be wrong. The boy stopped and listened. The girl decided that someone was walking towards them. She wanted to warn them that there was a monster, so she ran towards them. The boy yelled for the girl to stop. Gorza looked out from around the corner and saw whoever was looking for them. The girl regretted coming here. It was Jurg. Looking down at the girl, he asked where her useless brother was. Herm showed up after his sister. He said he was here, and he wasn't going to hide. Jurg took the girl's hand. He was not alone. The boy pointed at Herm with his companion and told them to grab him. The companion seized Herm. The young man said that if they killed him, they would regret it. Jurg asked what the worm was up to. The young man offered to send one of them forward. Only he must be quiet if he wanted to survive. Jurg told one of the deputies to go ahead and see what was going on, quietly so as not to attract attention. Herm tried to explain everything. He said that the cave collapsed not because of him. The young man couldn't finish. Jurg punched the young man in the chest with all his might. He was out of breath. His eyes nearly popped out of his head. Jurg told Herm to shut his mouth. 
no one is asking him. Now his assistant will come running, and the young man will be finished. A guy came running in and said there's a monster centipede. It's gigantic. We have to get out of here right now, before it's too late. The old man who was with Jurg started asking for help, tearing the remaining hair on his head and asking what they should do. The other assistant asked what the boss's plan was. The guy said we should warn everyone about it, so we don't get in trouble. Herm said it's a great way for those who want to lose merit. Germ wondered what the guy meant by that. Herm explained, there was no reason to give someone else their credit. The centipede could be destroyed by them. Last time, they had given a lot of credit for such a centipede. The old man remembered that the servants of God had been blessed with nearly 200 merits for their righteous deeds. Herm added that it's a centipede, a walking bag of merit. Why give it to anyone? They can take the sack themselves. You just have to approach the issue in the right way. One of Jurga's aides cried out in fear. The dead don't need credit, and we have to run away from here. Jurg told the man to shut up. Herm voiced a valid point. I wonder what else he can come up with. Herm stated that the centipede is blind, and it is only oriented by sound. Their weapons are weak. They can't kill her. They won't even be able to hurt her, the young man continued. Their plan would be very simple. They would drive the centipede into the acid pits. Borza said the centipede moves much faster than they do, and there's no escaping it. The brothers said they wouldn't run away. They'll spread out in equal distances to get her attention, and they'll roll the dice. They'll use sound to send the centipede straight into the acid pits. The old man said the plan is pretty good, who interestingly enough will be the bait. Jurg said Herm will be the bait, that's his plan, let him do it. This item is non-negotiable. Borza shouted her brother was still recovering from his injury. If something happened, he would definitely not be able to run away. So she agreed to go in her brother's place. The boy said he was fine. He would be the bait. The guy added that he would need help to open the acid pit doors, and asked Jurg to help him. Jurg said he'd be happy to help. He's gotta be involved in some way too. Herm said, then we can proceed with this plan, and the bag of merit is in their pocket. The sister asked her brother what he was up to. After all, the centipede could destroy him. The young man replied that he had a plan, but if he fails, the girl must be ready to run with all her might. The girl asked how she would know if he failed. Herm replied, in that case, he would start yelling, and that would be the signal for the girl to run away. The centipede monster spit out the bones left from its previous victim. The monster was ready to go in search of a new victim. Herm talked about his plan. When the monster gets close, you have to throw a bone to make the centipede head in the direction of the sound. Sav will go into the tunnel first and get its attention. Sav asked why he was. He is the youngest among all of them, and he doesn't want to be bait. Jurg told Saul to shut up and do as he's told. I mean, he always said he was the fastest runner. Now's his chance to prove it. When Sav throws the bone, he should run to the glowing moss. And don't worry, the centipede is blind, so it won't see him. If it gets close to him, he should stay still and try to hold his breath. Sav said he'd stand there like a stiff and stop breathing. The centipede won't feel him. Herm added that Sav should stand necessarily near the glowing moss, so that others could see him. And Jurg should stand near the glowing crystal, which is near the turn. Once he is near it, they will open the door and lure the centipede inside. The young man will run out and close the door. Jurg said it's not a bad plan, and they're gonna stick to it, and that no one would fail. Herm reminded Jurg to remember to help him, otherwise he can't do it alone, because the door is heavy. The young men proceeded to execute their plan. Sav cautiously crept toward the centipede. The monster listened and tried to locate a new victim. The centipede heard someone nearby and moved in that direction. Sav turned and ran. His eyes expressed terror. He screamed in fear. All of this was just right. The beast was moving in the right direction. Sav grabbed the bone and thought that the centipede must be blind just as Herm had promised. The young man had very little time. The guy had a skull in his hand. There was no time to choose anything else. Sav swung around and threw the skull far forward. That's where the centipede should have gone. The monster moved toward the sound. So far, the plan was working perfectly. Sav was on his knees and crying silently. He was very frightened. But the centipede passed by. Jurg listened intently. The centipede was approaching. From the sound of it, it had passed Gorza and was on its way to Hork. Jurg decided to signal Herm. He realized a hand high up. He was visible because he was near the glowing crystal. Jurg was up to something. He thought Herm was waving goodbye to him. Because of him, his brother was whipped. He wouldn't forgive that. Jurg grabbed the bone and thought he felt sorry for Herm's little sister. There was no telling who would take care of her in the future. Suddenly, 
A bone fell near the young man. There was a sound. The centipede heard it at once. The monster stopped. It changed its trajectory. It didn't go as planned. Jurg yelled for Herm to catch, and threw the skull in his direction. A skull fell near Herm. It was a new source from the noise, and a new direction. Herm was now in danger. The centipede opened its mouth and moved towards Herm. The young man could have been trapped. Jurg had set him up. Jurg thought, once the two of them are in the cave, he'll slam the door shut. The monster would kill the guy, and the acid vapors would kill the monster. Jurg was pleased with himself. This was his plan. This was revenge, and he hoped it would work out that way. Jurg wondered why the centipede didn't react to the sound, why it stopped near him. The boy was scared. Herm threw a skull at the centipede, hit it in the tooth. The beast was angry. You could tell by the look on its face. Herm yelled for Jurg to run away faster. They would lure her into the cave now. They should be able to do it. The beast went after the young man. There was not a second to lose. The centipede had already opened its horrible mouth. Herm shouted and showed Jurg where to hide. He himself stood near the open door, behind which was the acid. The centipede dashed past the standing Herm. The young man did not move or breathe. He could feel the air currents the monster created as it moved. Centipede disappeared behind the door. Herm immediately slammed the door shut. He did so with lightning speed. After the door slammed shut, the young man immediately bolted it shut, so that it could not be opened from the inside. The guy barely made it. He decided that in his next life, he would think of better plans. The young man breathed a sigh of relief. The young men came running in. Borza saw her brother and said thank God he was alright. Sav asked where Jurg was now. What happened to him? Herm said he was sorry. Germ made a noise, and the centipede chased after him. The two of them ran inside, but the centipede grabbed Jurg. The young man had to lock them in there. The old man said, May the gods praise the young man's bravery. It's sad. The boss was a good friend. Herm said that he didn't need fame. If the youths tell the others that Jurg killed the monster, he will honor the bravery of the brave young man. The old man, with tears in his eyes, said that Herm was a good guy, and they would not forget what he had done. Herm said that it was time for his sister and him to go on their way. The old man added, May God's blessing be with them always. Borza asked her brother if it was true that Jurg had decided to sacrifice himself, and what really happened. Herm said that's pretty much what happened. The centipede knew not only by sound, but also by scent. The girl noticed that Jurg got what he deserved. Borza called out to her brother. She guessed what had really happened. The girl looked at her brother with sincere eyes. What's the matter? His sister told him to eat. There was something unusual on the plate. The young man didn't even know what it was called. The boy grimaced. He didn't want to touch it. He wanted to explain to his sister that he wouldn't eat it. The girl said with a smile that it was her brother's favorite dish. And Herm shouldn't refuse. The girl saved the head especially for him. The guy grimaced, looking at his plate, and said he didn't want that. He just doesn't have an appetite right now. The girl gave him a stern look. She resolutely stuck the knife into the table and ordered her brother to eat, leaving him no choice. The young man felt sick. He was afraid he was going to vomit. Herm told his sister that he would try it now. The boy touched it with his tongue. He couldn't do much more than that. Gag reflex kicked in. The young man rushed to the trash can and vomited. There was no way to hold on. The girl looked at her brother in surprise. Herm looked at his sister. He wanted to apologize to her. The young man understood what his sister was feeling right now. Gorza looked at her brother with anger. She knew it. She knew after what had happened in the acid pits. The girl extended her knife hand forward threateningly. She asked who he was. He's obviously not Herm, so he's a demon. The young man threw his hands up in the air. He said he wasn't a demon and asked his sister to put the knife down. He could prove everything to her now. Gorza says she's ready to hear him out. She wondered what he was going to prove to her now. The boy tried to think of something urgently. He had to tell his sister something to reassure her. And he said, Marin powder. The girl looked at her brother in surprise. What does he mean by that? Stop speaking in riddles. The guy repeated, Marin powder. He'll mix it with water. Like he did at the holy ceremony last year and drink it. Demons don't like that stuff. If it catches fire after the drink, it means her little brother will come back to her, albeit slightly charred. And if that doesn't happen, the young man added, then he is her real brother, and that would be good proof. Herm asked how the sister was doing with such a test. The girl said she didn't even know, and looked at her brother with disbelief. Just in case, Gorza kept the knife still in her hand. 
The guy said they had a deal, and he's going to go look for the powder now. The guy would pour the liquid into a glass, and he'd say that when he drank it, the girl would have to believe he wasn't a demon. Gorza continued to threaten the young man with the knife, saying less words, more deeds. The guy, drinking this liquid, hoped that all those holy ceremonies with powder, exercising demons and the like, were just superstitions. And if it wasn't, maybe he'd return to his past body. After the guy drank a glass of liquid, his eyes went to his forehead. He cried out. His face turned gray. The girl looked at her brother in horror. What's happening to him? Maybe it's the demon coming out. The guy took a breath and said it was a big gross. How could he do that? Gorza started slapping the young man on the back and saying that Herm was a fool. He really frightened her and that he shouldn't do it again. The young man smiled and said the girl called him Herm, so she believes he's not a demon. That reassured him. The girl said he's the real Herm and she believes him. The young man says he's not really Herm, he's a Tanachi, a dreamer of worlds. With a wink of one eye, the sister said that the young man had chosen the laziest of all the gods. Tanachi. The guy claimed to be a lazy ass himself, that explains it. The girl decided to close the subject. She said that he is her real brother, and she believes him. But why is he acting so strange? After his recovery, it's like he's different, and she wants to hear the truth from him. The young man thought that his father had once told him about such a thing. Maybe telling his sister now was the only chance he had to find out what had happened to him. The young man said he has memories from another life, and they are very real. In fact, he never fully understood what had happened. His body sank into the abyss like a raging river, and his soul was carried far away. At some point he found himself involuntarily reaching for the shining ball of light. After that, he woke up, finished the young man. He had a headache, dizziness, and new memories. That's all he knows. And the boy swore it to his sister. The girl cried out in horror. Doesn't her brother realize what this means? Herm asked if the girl thought he was a god who had been reborn into the body of a mortal. The girl cheerfully declared that she thought so. After all, it had been a long time since they had shown up. Especially not among the Greyborn. Does the young man have any unusual abilities? The girl asked. Maybe he can run faster than an arrow, or pull a team of horses, or leap across a chasm. Gorza looked at her brother carefully. She wanted an answer from him that would satisfy her. The girl asked again if he could confirm any of his superpowers. Herm said sadly that he had none of that, and he's just a regular guy. The girl was not discouraged, she said. Then perhaps he is, a lost soul. She didn't want to be disappointed. Lost souls are beings who have no unusual abilities, but have memories from another life. They don't often make it to fame. Maybe the memories he has are those of legendary artisans or natural leaders. The guy said, he might be one of those. Herm apologized to the girl for upsetting her. Gorza said conversely, thanking the gods. They don't need another chosen one. The girl asked that her brother never tell anyone about it. If the others found out that he had, for example, treasure memories, you can imagine what they would do to him. The guy concluded, they'd try him first, then kill him, or sent for experimentation. The girl screamed for her brother to stop saying such things. If he gets extraordinary powers, he mustn't show them to anyone. The young man told the girl that she need not worry. He won't lose his arms and legs because he doesn't particularly want to. Gorza covered his ears with his hands. He didn't want to hear all that. The girl stated if anyone sees it, she has no idea what to do about it. The young man showed what could happen to him in such a case. The guy has no idea what to do about it either. That was why he hadn't said anything to his sister before. He didn't want her to worry. The girl declared that she understood everything. There was thoughtfulness in her eyes. Every time, life gets more complicated. My sister asked what my brother's memories were. He sounded like a nobleman, if he could tell her anything. The young man said that he wasn't a nobleman. He had memories of a guy from another world. Herm said he was a rebel, someone who tried to change society for the better and went against the system. Gorza was interested. She asked what had happened to that young man. The girl wanted to hear the rest of the story. Herm said that young man made a mistake. It was a fatal mistake. That young man was murdered by the nobles who opposed him. It was a despicable murder. The girl marveled once again. She was gripped by the story. She was extremely attentive. The sister suddenly shuddered. Her brother wouldn't try to pull the same thing in their world. The young man winked at his sister and said he wasn't an idiot, and he wouldn't make other people's mistakes. The girl looked at her brother in disbelief. Her eyes were surprised, threatened, and pleading. The young man understood everything. The young man said that his sister could tell him nothing. He understood without words.
Herm added that he is not a warrior with a sharp sword and shining armor. He has no army, no mages either. So he would not do such things for the time being. The girl asked her brother who the mages were. She had heard the word for the first time. Guy tried to explain to his sister. Magicians are like shamans, only more consistent. They interact less with spirits, but more with magical energy. Gorza was surprised. The young man spoke as if he knew everything about this magic. The girl looked at her brother with delight. The sister was scared again. Her brother doesn't know anything about magic, does he? He doesn't need that kind of knowledge. The boy tried to reassure his sister. She doesn't feel a bit of that magic in him, does she? The girl said she didn't. She sighed in relief. The young man told the girl to stop talking so much about things she didn't know anything about. If the guy was using magic, she would have sensed it long ago. That's why they're kept here. Scarecrows can sense magic because it's in their blood. That's why scarecrows are good for the rest of us. The young man spoke convincingly. The girl did not understand much, but she agreed with her brother. She said that the brother was right. The girl once again turned to her brother. She looked into his eyes. She wanted reassurance. Gorza asked Herm to make her a promise, and it's very serious. The boy wondered what his sister wanted from him this time. After all, he was very frank with her. The sister asked her brother to never change again. And she said, please. It's very important to her. The brother hugged his sister. The girl felt a kindred spirit. It warmed her. The guy made her promise that no matter what happened, he would be her brother forever. And he would protect her. The young man opened his eyes. His head was bandaged. He squinted against the bright light, asked what was going on, and where he was. The young man told him to be quieter and not to make any sudden movements. The bullet pierced his chest, Brutus said. His condition is still assessed as critical. The young man looked at Brutus and called him by name and asked if it was him. Brutus replied, who else could it be? Did the young man have a lapse of memory? The boy rose from the bed and held his head. Was this all really a dream? He was very thoughtful. Maria asked what the young man was dreaming about. Why he was worried about his dream. The young man said they wouldn't believe it. He dreamed of some monsters, of another life in which he had become a slave. The guy continued, in the dream he wasn't human. That's hard to believe. Brutus said it all sounds like complete nonsense. It must be the effects of the wound. It'll pass. The young man lay down on the bed again and said he knew it. The boy asked to be helped out of bed. And at that moment, he looked at his hands. The young man was scared again. His hands were gray in color, just like in the dream. He couldn't understand anything. The young man tried to calm down. It's just a dream. I need to come to my senses. Brutus said there was nothing they could do about it and apologized for it. The guy got out of bed and said he missed them. Maria stated that she too missed the young man. In his new life, he would achieve even greater heights. He must promise her that. The young man said he's promising, and they could count on him. The boy was still thoughtful. The young men told the sick man to make a difference in the world. The young man said it's not a question. After all, they know better than anyone that he will shake the world so that not a lot will not seem to everyone. The boy began to come to his senses. The young people said they would definitely see each other again soon and they began to disappear in a strange way. Brutus said that he would now keep the young man company, and pointed with his finger at the chair on which the young man was sitting. On which sat a young man. The young man from his dream. And this young man was real. Unlike the young men, who disappeared. The young men looked at each other, and silent. It was as if they were studying each other. The guy lifted himself off the bed and asked, Is he Herm? Couldn't someone else have been left here? The next instant the chair was empty. Herm walked over to the headboard of the bed on which the young man lay. Herm said that he had feelings too, after all. The boy was very upset. The young man asked Herm means he hadn't disappeared after all. And maybe it wasn't a dream. Or maybe he was dreaming. Herm said his own body is real. And he's real. The young man apologized to Herm. And said that this body should be managed by someone else. And now he should get some rest. Herm got nervous and said it was his body. And he didn't want to leave it. The young man says he will take good care of him, and Herm realizes that only he can change his life. Herm said sadly that it was probably true, but it's hard to admit it. The young man told Herm not to be discouraged. He would be remembered for a long time. Herm asked the young man if he could do something for him. Herm asked that he should always be frank with his sister. He doesn't want to see her suffer. Young stated, although he never had a sister, he would take care of her as his own. The young man promised to make the world of Herma a better place. It will be the best place for Herm and his sister, and they'll be happy there. 
Herm smiled and said that in that case he would trust Leonard. And he thanked the young man. The young man also thanked Herm. Dawn. In the east, the sun rises over the mountain peaks. The young people are watching the sunrise. It's reflected in their eyes. It symbolizes the birth of a new world. Herm listens to the young people talking. He does not join them. His sister came over. She said she couldn't believe it. Her brother got up before her in the morning. He cleaned up and made breakfast. The girl asked if in a previous life he had been a servant. The young man asked her not to joke around like that. The girl said she wouldn't bother him with it anymore. The young men heard someone calling Herm's name. They looked back. There was surprise in their eyes. They knew him. But why had he come here? It was an old goblin man. He thought the young man was dead. That's news to me. The girl wondered why he thought that. The boy said he hoped it wouldn't happen anytime soon. The girl began to tell old man Coke what had happened to them the day before. The girl told about what had happened to Jurg from the third group. Herm remembered that Cole, the minder. He's a friend of the young men's father. He's been looking after them since their parents died. That was two years ago when there was the Heveling attack. It is strange to see the overseer getting along well with the slaves. There are good people in this world too. The old man wondered if Herm had helped defeat the centipede. The young man said he just runs faster than a centipede. Old Cole laughed. Herm, he said in all his glory, nobody runs better than that boy. The old man is glad to hear that it wasn't anything serious. Wouldn't want to waste merit to let him idle. There's a lot of work to do today. The old man said there was a job for Gorza at the mushroom farm today. Young men are standing in line for work. Guards with guns guard them. Crystals illuminate the area. A young man says of someone that he has no merit, but has a sister. No sooner had the young man told his story to the end than his interlocutor grabbed him by the neck. And then he immediately pressed his head to the ground. The narrator was bleeding. The guy sternly warned that there were to be no girls. They don't do that. They don't sell or buy them. The narrator apologized. The third youth told the man to let him go. If he had injuries, there would be many questions from the overseers. The young men looked at each other. They understood each other without words. The narrator was on his knees, hunched over, coughing up blood. He'd had a good beating. The guy who was hurt by the story about the girls said he'd feed it to the Hevelings next time. The young man apologized. He said that the boss was very reverent towards working girls. The boss's father died early, so his mother started working part-time to support the family. The guy asked what happened to his mother. She died too. The interviewer said yes, she was dead. She had black spots. It could have been cured, but it would have cost a fortune. The boss was trying to scrape together the credit while her mother's clients were leaving her. The young man said angrily that these greens would never admit to having a little fun with her before she died. The guy concluded that the boss was very serious about this topic, and it's best to remember that for the future. One of the workers said to stop all this, otherwise more people will go to Virga. The young man asked if he had explained the rules to them. The young man asked if he had explained the rules. The guy said he told them they could steal and expect protection, but they can't touch the girls, but they're guys. And that's why they sometimes think with more than just their heads. The boss said they don't need people like that. They can give them to Virga. The young man told the boss not to be so harsh. And he calmed down. No men, no team. They already have fewer men than Virga. The guy told the boss that his favorite bug is back. The young man was surrounded by a group of people. They appraised him with glances. Each of them expressed displeasure and disdain. The guy said this young man had a lot of courage. I don't know why the boss likes him so much. The boss looked at the young man with regret. He felt sorry for him. He was small and seemed defenseless. The young man looked very small compared to his opponents. He seemed to have no strength at all. The three men often humiliated and robbed him. The young man could do nothing against them. The boss had a memory. Once upon a time, three hoodlums met a guy walking home with groceries. He was just a kid then. The kid got scared when he saw them. The miscreants, threatening him with weapons, wanted to take away his groceries and leave the young man without food. The young man shrank back in fear. He pressed the food hard against his body and clenched his eyes shut. Tears flowed from his eyes. Suddenly there was a noise. The boy opened one eye. He was curious. The young man opened both eyes and couldn't believe what he was seeing. The young man gave those three a good smack and held out his hand to the boy. The boy could not believe his eyes. Danger had been spared. It turns out there is good in the world. There's a saying that no good deed goes unpunished. The day he helped Vite, he realized the meaning. Vate had never looked like a young man. They were brothers, though. The young men watch the sleeping green guard. The boy steals the keys from the sleeping green guard. 
and the satisfied young men with groceries run away. The young people enjoy eating the food they have just gotten, but sooner or later, everything comes to an end. The young men had to fulfill their military service. When they went on their annual expedition to the deepest levels to cleanse them of shevelings and other pests, the young man with Vait was in the vanguard along with Virga and his comrades. The young men fought side by side and showed examples of courage and bravery. The goblins expected them to die in battle, but his boys worked themselves day and night, and they came out of this mess alive. The young men have won. They defeated the monsters and cleared a path for themselves. The young men saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and that gave them hope. They had faith in their eyes. The warriors came out into the open. They saw real vegetation. The sun shone brightly in the sky. The warriors were going to take a break. They were choosing a place to do so. After they set up camp, they were divided into two groups. A group of young men were sent to the deepest part of the level. Ufa was sent to the nearest lake. Virga was sent to the other end of the cave. As they were sent to the most dangerous place, Veit asked to go with Ulf. The young people said goodbye before parting. They did not know when they would meet next time. The young man wanted Veit to be safe, so he was only too happy to oblige his request. But it happened that they were ambushed by a group of hevelings. They had to fight their way back to the camp. The battle was not easy. Many fighters were wounded. Some stayed there forever. There were few survivors. The young man led his group out, with the fewest casualties. On the way they came across another group. There were many more casualties. The enemy spared no one. The forces were unequal. The warrior's throat was slit. The death was horrible. It was Ulf's group. The whole group was literally chopped to pieces, and there was no sign of Vait. One of the warriors showed me what he found there. It was interesting. In a thicket in the marsh, a trail was visible. The young man was angry. He didn't care who did it, who took his brother. He just wanted him back. A young man and his squad followed the trail. He found a young man lying in blood. The young man was lying face down in blood and showed no signs of life. The boy looked around suspiciously. Maybe it's an ambush. There was an extraneous noise in the distance. His suspicions were justified. The warrior was angry about being trapped. There were twice as many opponents and they were well armed, and they had prepared for this. The enemy had the whole unit surrounded. There was no escape. The forces were unequal. The guys in his squad knew how to fight and could keep a tight defense. They defended themselves very tightly. The warriors engaged in a bloody battle. The battle was fierce and violent. The young man was confident of victory and had no doubts about his squad. The opponent was outnumbered, and they had a favorable strategic position. The young man was ready to fight to the last man. He didn't think about himself. He had to lead his squad out of the ambush. The guy felt something was wrong with his body. The young man released the weapon from his hands. He went down on one knee. He had been wounded. Blood flowed from his body. The young man was stabbed by Vait. He was a blind fool. It was a set-up ambush. The squad is on the defensive. Despite the betrayal, the warriors are not going to give up. One of the soldiers jumps up over his colleagues and throws his spear at the enemy. He will fight to the last man, even if they run out of weapons. They will be ready to defeat their opponents with their bare hands. The enemy is cunning, most likely plotting something. Everyone wants to avoid casualties. His eyes are clouded with hatred. He clearly wants to do something insidious, using the element of betrayal. The warrior notices something and shouts to his companions to pay attention too. The young man is on one knee, holding his wounded side. Vait holds a knife to his throat. Vait yells for them to stop resisting if they value the commander's life. Vait holds a knife to the young man's throat. The warriors feel sorry for their commander, and they stop resisting, and lower their weapons. The young man asks Veit why he did what he did. Veit tells Rock to forgive him. While he was dragging him around, he realized that his life was going nowhere good. And Virga made him a great offer, one he couldn't refuse. Rack told Veit they were brothers. How could he do that? He'd always taken care of him. Veit said with anger, does he really believe this nonsense? What brothers? A young man sits surrounded by girls. Good food is brought to him. Vait watches his brother from the sidelines. He sits alone. Power, friends, women. It was all readily available to him. Vait, on the other hand, remained only in Cancer's shadow. And then he realized that he possessed a rather valuable thing, one that not everyone had. It was his brother's trust. That's when Vait decided to use that trust. That's when he got the offer, an offer he couldn't refuse. Vait told Rack not to worry. He would be sure to tell his sister how he died saving the expedition from the Havelings. Vait whispered in Rack's ear that his sister would be very grateful to him for this. And her beautiful body would be grateful too. Vait imagined how he'd deal with Rack now. Just then, someone approached him from the side. Vait looked at him. It was Virga. 
Virgus said that only an idiot brags to his opponent when he's still alive. Enough talk. We just have to finish him off. Vate answered, he thought. His master must strike the final blow. Virgus said that a warrior who dies at the hand of a traitor sounds kind of poetic. Vate said he agreed with his master. Vate swung his knife at Rack and told the man that he would be a good friend and would cherish what he left behind. Rack overcame the pain, out of his last strength, grabbed his axe and swung. With a sharp movement in the blink of an eye, the warrior cut off the hands of the recalcitrant Vite. The young man was horrified. Rock stood to his full height and told Vate that he would deal with him later. He had other matters to attend to now. Rack's squad shouted, Boss, what should they do? Rack was furious. He was ready to destroy all enemies, and there was no stopping him. Rack shouted that Virga had thrown his troop to the wolves, and he himself had cowardly fled. The opponents were in a panic. Without a commander, they didn't know what to do. Their squad had fallen apart. Virga was gone, and his men scattered like sand. Rock's unit was victorious. Many warriors were wounded, but they did not falter, and their commander did not let them down. Rock grabbed Vate and put him on his shoulder. The young man's hands were bleeding. Vate begged to be spared. He said he had been forced to do this. He had been threatened. They said if he refused, they would kill absolutely everyone. Ruck stated that Vate would then be better off cutting his throat open. Rack said that he was saying goodbye to Vate and wished him luck in his next life. Vate asked what he meant by that. The young people heard strange sounds. Such sounds are usually made by insects. The sounds were loud. The insects were probably huge too. Vate asked for help. He was telling the young man to spare him. Cancer was cold-blooded and ruthless. He would not forgive betrayal. Rock said that mercy comes at a high cost. That's exactly what Vate taught him. He wouldn't make that mistake again. Cancer was cold-blooded. But at that moment, something in his soul snapped. He would never be the same again. The young man was still standing near the three hooligans. They stared at him intently. The warrior asked the boss what they should do. They mustn't let the scum of Virga do such things in their territory. The boss said to leave him alone. Some people can't use words to explain things. Let them explain it to him in another language. The Virgi warrior sputtered and asked the young man what he thought he was doing here. The young man stood with his fists clenched and looked calmly at his opponent. The big bald man repeated his question once more. He was furious that his question had been ignored. The boy continued to stare at him in silence. Baldi was distracted by his co-worker. He had something to say to him. A colleague said he thinks it's the same Herm they've heard about. He's the brother of the same Gorza, the one who refused to work for Virga. The young man's eyes filled with anger after hearing about his sister. The bald big man noticed that the young man was angry. That gave him some nerve, so he decided to harass the boy further. Baldi said that kid caused the tunnel to collapse. Maybe a rock hit him in the head, and he's not thinking straight. I guess this kid only understands when he gets yelled at. Baldi told Herm to get the hell out of here. He's not gonna say it again. Herm replied that it would be if he didn't go anywhere. It's his own business. Baldi said that in that case he would cut this guy into little pieces. The bald man had no time to finish his sentence. Herm's knife flashed in his hand. Blood spurted immediately. Baldi grabbed his throat. Blood trickled from under his arm, and his eyes rolled back. He began to wheeze. Herm said it was not a good idea to expose your throat to the enemy, and suggested that he memorize his words. They might come in handy in his next life. The bald man's companions were terrified. The boy killed him. The boy had killed Varg. It was unbelievable. Baldi was lying on the ground, in a pool of his own blood. Herm looked at the two men and said, Yes, he killed him. The terrified men said Herm didn't realize what he had done. It wasn't supposed to happen. Herm said he understood perfectly well. He got into Virga's business and killed one of his lieutenants. So he's in the crosshairs now. And now, he said, they must answer his question. These two were very frightened. They were willing to do anything. As long as they didn't get hurt, the young man asked, Isn't he the only one in the crosshairs? Aren't they all in the crosshairs? They're all victims here. They're oppressed, humiliated, forced to fight over territory. But they're one people. They're all greyborn. Why then are they slaves? The young man asked the question, but he did not hear the answer. The boy answered himself. They are slaves because of cowards like these two. They suffer every day. Their friends suffer. Their loved ones suffer too. Their whole life, an endless cycle of suffering. Herm shouted, This can't go on any longer. We can't take it anymore. Those who agree with him, let them join him, and they will stand shoulder to shoulder for liberation. Who among them is ready to begin to live, 
not to exist, some of the young men thought for a moment. There was some truth in Herm's words. Why hadn't they thought of it before? The boss covered his face with his hands. He had heard the truth. His warrior was also interested in the speech. The young men began to think. Even these two, the bald man's associates, decided that Herm was right, and it's worth listening to him. The old man, and some others, shouted that the young man was right. Enough of tolerating lawlessness. They have had enough. They don't want to be slaves anymore. The young man yelled to get the hell out of here and threw a rock at Verga's men. He shouted for them to molest someone else, and burn in hell, and left them alone. One of the two raised his hand with the knife up and yelled for everyone to stop. The guy said they thought if this Herm could handle Varg, they could handle them. They're wrong. Verga's men can't be controlled by anyone. If anyone rises up against them, they'll beat the crap out of them. The warrior said if there were any brave ones among them, let them come to him, and he will see what they are worth. The young man dropped the stone from his hand. He had no desire to continue proving anything. The old man also changed his mind about his rights, and everyone around him began to calm down. The warrior said that's what he thought. All they can do is talk. A bunch of cowards and weaklings, incapable of anything. And he told them to get back to work fast. Herm was left standing alone, clenching his fists. His encouragement was short-lived. Herm stood alone against the two bullies. Everyone else's fervor waned. The boss thought it wouldn't work to turn mice into hewlings. So he called the kid an underachiever. These kids think that a few bright words are enough to change the world. The young man offered to help the kid. The boss explained, you don't have to do that. The kid has to wise up on his own. Otherwise it won't make sense, or he'll die, which would probably be quicker. The young man decided to let the boy be mocked some more. And if things got bad for him, they would step in and save him. He said it was a good idea from his boss. The bully with the knife said for Herm to start pleading with him. And if he likes pleading, he'll do it quickly. Maybe. The young man thought, so what if they're weak? The villain looked at the young man with wide open eyes. He did not understand why the young man was not afraid of him. Herm turned even more gray with anger. He said that just because they were weak didn't mean they could be mocked and trampled into the dirt. They shouldn't let the arrogant get their hands dirty and profit from their labor. They shouldn't have to put up with their loved ones being bullied. The crowd around them is starting to pay attention to Herm again. Herm continued, they shouldn't make their lives a nightmare. Herm said to the villain's face, he refuses to live like this and he intends to stop it. Herm shouted to the villain that he had almost died once and then his whole life flashed before his eyes. The young man's eyes burned with hatred. He decided that everyone must realize that this is no way to live and everyone must change it. The villains asked what Herm had seen. They were curious about it too. The young man said he saw nothing, absolutely nothing. There was only a perishable life in which there was nothing good. And that life was boring and uninteresting, and there was nothing to cling to. In this life he worked every day and received nothing for his labor. The young man continued, the life of a slave could not even be called life. It was a living hell. It could only end after death. The guy said he realized after that, if he's already living in hell, what could be worse? What he could lose, what each of them has to lose. They all have the same life. They're all living in hell. They are all weak. They often shake with fear. But if they unite, they can do the impossible. Herm said he was asking his siblings to lend him their power. And in return, he would lend his own. He will be their sword. He will be their shield. And they will regain their dignity. Everyone raised their hands and started chanting and saying the young man's name, Herm. Someone shouted for Herm to be careful. He was in danger. Fury flashed in the young man's eyes. His reaction was lightning fast. The young man was approached by a villain with a knife. The villain's eyes were sly and cunning. He wanted to be sneaky. The young man received a small scratch on his shoulder. It was not dangerous. The villain wanted to strike the young man. Herm dodged him as best he could. The knife glittered in the hand of the enemy. The young man did not stand still. The boy twisted his opponent's arm and stabbed him with his knife. The young man used a clever move. There was nothing the enemy could do. The young man twisted the villain's arm and made him plunge the knife into his chest. Blood splattered in all directions. The villain fell to the ground. His knife was sticking out of his chest. Herm said, one less, where are the others? The boy looked excitedly at his enemies. He was ready for any development of the situation. His nostrils flared. He was not going to calm down. The crowd, energized by Herm's actions and his words, began to beat the second villain with their feet. The young man shouted that Virga was nobody. He and his aides are few in number, and there are a legion of them, and he thanked his brothers for supporting him. 
Herm urged them to follow him, and he swore on his life that he would drive out the villains once and for all. Applause was heard. Someone clapped at the young man's words. The young man looked in the direction from which the clapping sounded. It was Ruck. The guy said he wanted to talk to Herm face to face. The girl ran without looking back. She wanted to find her brother. Herm held the bandage in his hand. His shoulder was bleeding slightly. The girl ran up to the young man and screamed what he had done. How could he do such a thing? They had an agreement. The young man didn't understand what the girl meant. She told him not to pretend. Everyone around him is talking about it. He condemned them to death by killing Virga's men. The boy re-wrapped his wound and told his sister it was necessary. He's in control of his own life and he'll take care of his sister. The girl asked with horror in her eyes what it was necessary to kill them for, why he needed to do it. The guy told his sister in order to make friends. He knows what he's doing. The girl questioned what it meant to make friends. How could friendship and these murders be connected? It's absurd. Herm asked his sister to sit down. The boy intended to explain everything to the girl. He had to do it. To avoid misunderstandings in the future. The girl looked sternly at her brother. She had no idea what he could say to her that would make her calm down. The young man said it was her business. She'll listen to him standing up. Because he has to explain everything to her anyway. They need allies to survive. There are two strong camps in this part of the mine. Rack and Virga. Rack is stronger. Virga is supported by the overseers. That's why he's in a better position. If one wants to have influence, one should join Virga. But there is one important point. Virga has too many people, and everyone wants power. If you join Virga, you'll die working for him like the rest of us. It's different with Arrak. Cancer doesn't have the same favorable position. Cancer will consider him an ally as long as he's being helpful. The young man showed the crayfish what he wanted to see. It worked. Cancer came to the young man himself and offered him a partnership. But not everything went according to his plan. There were nuances. The crowd lynched Virga's man. At the same time, he asked for help. Rack wanted to execute this scoundrel, and he was determined. But the young man stopped him and didn't let him do it. Rack asked why he was doing this. What is he even doing? It's the enemy. Herm stated that he should be released. It would be the right thing to do. Cancer was indignant, saying it was a bad joke. If you show your rival your kindness, he'll come running tomorrow and cut off the young man's head or his sister. Herm tried to explain his position. It didn't matter if they killed him or not. He had already caused Virga a lot of trouble. The boy added that showing kindness to a victim of this cursed world wouldn't be so bad. All of them had hit rock bottom at some point and tried to find something to help them get stronger. Some had even done terrible things. But the young man believes that each of their kind deserves a chance at redemption. Even if they are drowning in despair, they are still trying to swim out of it. The young man looked at the villain and wondered if his brother could swim out of the abyss of despair. The villain looked at his colleague, who lay dead in a pool of blood. He didn't like this fate. This villain shouted loudly that he can do it. He's ready, and he can do it. K-Germ told Raku, He knows it's hard for him, but they need to show that they are not like Virga's people. And the best way to do that is to show mercy. Rak was silent. He stared intently at the young man. There was anger in his eyes. But he was beginning to doubt himself a little. Herm also looked intently into Rak's eyes. He became between a warrior and a villain. Rak must now make his choice. The young man said that Herm was up to a dangerous game, but he likes it. The boy got a sparkle in his eyes. Herm looked up at the big man from below and thanked him for those words. The warrior says Herm can call him Hem. He only lets the tough guys call him that. To the rest of us, he's Hemgal. Herm thanked Hem and asked Ruck to let his opponent go home. That would benefit everyone. Hem told the boss he advised him to listen to this kid. He may be small, but he's got guts. Rack didn't answer anything. He remained silent. The warrior hadn't made a decision yet, but there was a brainstorm in his head. He weighed the pros and cons for himself. Finally, Rock raised his hand and said, let it be so. Let's do as the young man wants. The villain couldn't believe his luck. He thought he would never get out of here alive. In the next instant, the boy was already running with all his legs to his camp. At the last moment, he stopped. Something flashed through his mind. The villain turned around and said to the young man, thank you, brother. After that, the guy ran off without a backward glance in the direction of his house. The deed was done. Herm told Ruck, it didn't turn out so bad. Ruck called the guy crazy. Herm heard someone whispering to the side. They didn't believe the boy would be released. It didn't seem right. I guess everyone here has been living in fear for too long. Maybe something will start to change. The warden appeared. He asked if the two had finished their performance. Hem and Rack tensed. 
there was nothing good to expect from the wardens. The warden and Herm said hello like old friends. The warden asked how Herm's sister was doing. The young man said that she was doing well and that they had finished everything here. The warden swung his whip and said that in that case, everyone get to work. There will be no more performances, everyone has to work their daily quota, or he'll flog them all. Ruck asked if the warden wasn't mad at the young man. Herm said it's a friend of the family. He might get mad if they don't leave here now, and asked Ruck if he had a place to talk. Eventually, Ruck eventually agreed to cooperate with Herm. He would protect them from Virga and help with the creation of their own faction. That was the end of the young man's story. The sister asked and what Rack would get in return. Herm said he agreed to be his vassal, and their territory would be between Cancer and Virga. The girl concluded meaningfully. Her brother was now the boss of the gang. Wasn't that what he wanted? The guy said he needs the power to protect his loved ones. He can't do it on his own, so he needs help. The boy added that he needed his sister's help too, and she should agree with him. The girl asked, looking intently into the young man's eyes. Is her brother still a part of him? The boy nodded affirmatively and said that he loved his sister very much, and often reminds him of her. The girl asked what his name was. What is his real name? She wants to know it immediately. The young man wondered if it really mattered that much. What if he had to run away from her? Otherwise, she would be able to control him, and he would become her servant. The girl said he must lay everything out immediately. Otherwise, she would go after the priestess. The young man raised his hands and closed his eyes. He said his name was Leonard, but people just called him Leo. The girl told the lion to strike herself. Her posture was commanding and did not imply refusal. The boy tensed, clenched his fist, looked fearfully at his sister. The next moment the young man said he would not do it, and showed his sister his tongue. The girl smiled, a blush appearing on her cheeks. She said, all right then. The fat man kept running back to his camp. He did so without looking back. He was still scared. The phrase Herm had said flashed through his mind. Would he be able to swim, brother? The guy kept remembering that phrase all the way through and kept thinking about something. He had thoughts of something good in his mind. Children are near their parents. Then some villain showed up. A mother clutches her children fearfully to her. This villain turned out to be Virga's man. He was insatiable. This man Virgie said this guy has to go with him. And that's out of the question. The boy didn't want to do it. He didn't want to leave his family. He had little kids. It was explained to the guy what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't like this before. The two men took him to Virga's camp. His wife and children were left alone. The boy was led to Virga. He bowed to this warrior. Virga looked down at the young man from above. The boss explained what his men were to do, and what would be the young man's responsibility. Now, they will have to collect tribute, and no one cares that families will be left hungry. It was a different life. The guy didn't want it for himself. He started drinking a lot. There were different women around him, but he remembered his wife. He became a different person. He started hurting the weak, and took from them what was rightfully theirs. Various women began to appear around him frequently. He began to forget his wife and children. His family became destitute. It was very hard for them. The head of the family left them. This guy started to like this life, and he couldn't imagine another one for himself. But it wasn't the right life. Then Herm came along. Everything in his life changed. Maybe he had a chance. The boy remembered again the young man's words. Whether he could swim out. It was a chance to return to his past life. The guy thought, what is he doing with his life? How could he live like this? How could he leave his family behind? The guy remembered his wife and his kids, and he cried out that he could fix everything. He could escape from here, and they could start a new life. The boy ran and thought of only one thing. Cold sweat covered his face. How could he live like this? He can swim out. He mentally answered Herm that he could swim out. Improvised market. A woman with a child walks around looking for food. The goblin is calling for someone. The woman has no choice. She has a baby to feed. The goblin watches the old women laugh. They are discussing something. Gorza yells to her brother that she's not done yet. He yells that she's been packing all morning. So he speeds things up a bit. The girl screamed that she needed to save money. Because some people don't want to spend their merit. The guy said he was saving them for a wooden door for their cave. The girl declares that they don't need that door. They live next to the guards. And no one will dare to bother them especially since the young man is now being paid tribute. Doesn't he collect it like everyone else? The young man said it doesn't work that way. Cancer gave him control of this territory for a reason. It was because he wasn't getting anything out of it himself. He was just getting rid of unprofitable territory. The sister asked why he agreed to do it. What good would it do? It's just more trouble. 
The guy said great things are born in a humble abode. She would wait a little while and see everything. Someone called out to the young man. He told his sister it was Volker, his assistant, and asked him what happened. Volker said that Rack had just gotten the message. They just announced a new expedition to the lower level of the caves. Volker added that the expedition will start in two weeks. The brother and sister looked among themselves. Warriors amicably practicing the elements of hand-to-hand -hand combat with combat weapons in hand. The young man says his soldiers are ready for inspection. The young men salute their commander. Herm thanks Volker for a job well done. He wants to see what the warriors have learned during their training. Two soldiers are standing in formation and talking to each other, leaning on their weapons like a cane. They do not pay attention to the fact that the commander is in front of them. Herm walks up to these young men and kicks the weapon out with his foot. The young men did not expect this. The warrior didn't hold on, lost his balance, and fell face down. Herm said it was a weapon, not a cane, and it must be used for its intended purpose. When they stand in formation, they must stand at attention. Eyes forward and silent. Herm told Volker that each of the offenders must do 40 push-ups on the ground, and we need to follow up on that. The rest of you, you can start the practice fights. The soldiers lined up against each other for practice fights. There was strict discipline in this unit, and the soldiers underwent serious drill and combat training. Herm thought as he tried to teach the warriors tactics and the basics of combat. They had learned something. The young man realized that, after all, they were only a handful of miners. That was why the goblins had defeated them so easily. The expedition leader was injured, so the departure time was changed. There was additional time for training, but it was still not enough. The soldier told the commander that he had never held a weapon in his hands, but he's seen guards fighting heavilings. Perhaps we should train the soldiers to use long-range weapons. The young man thought it would be a good idea, but where to get wood that would make a decent bow? That is problematic in these parts. The rich and goblins hold all the quality materials for making weapons. Volker told the young man not to talk loudly about such things. There are a lot of ears around. It's dangerous. Herm replied that he understood everything. It's just that the situation is very dire. In fact, he wouldn't mind a rifle. Volker advised using slingshots and spears to achieve their goals. This could be an alternative. Herm said the stones are pretty fragile and will just shatter against the shells of the hevelings. Scarecrows aren't allowed to have too many spears. You could try clay bottles instead of stones. Volker doesn't get it. What clay bottles have to do with it? Herm replied that many different things could be poured into the bottle. A potion of paralysis. Sleeping powder. Bottles can be filled with anything. Even oil, and then set enemies on fire. Herm added that none of this was free. But there was no money left. He spent it all on wooden breastplates and helmets. Volker replied to the commander that the guys appreciated all of this. Now they're not empty-handed, and a protected head. Herm said it would be better if there was enough money for everything. Then his squad would be adequately staffed. The young man thought it would be a good idea to mine the metal. It could be used to make slingshots. That would be wonderful. Volker asked if lead would be good for this case. Herm said that would be fine. Lead could penetrate a bronze helmet. The young man added that they had no ore, and there is no one to smelt it. Volker said he has a friend, and he's worth talking to. Maybe he could help. Herm was very interested in this information. Volker added that this guy is in exile. His father saved this guy a long time ago. This guy can help, but it won't be for free. This young man is a specialist, and he won't charge much for the job. He can be trusted. Herm perked up immediately. He said that was a different conversation, and ordered Volker to lead him to the young man. Volker faltered. This guy turns down absolutely everyone. The exceptions are Volker's family and a few others. If you bring Herm to the guy, there's trouble. The young man thought that that fellow's pride prevented him from looking others in the eye after the banishment. Volker apologized to Herm for not being able to fully help. Herm said Volker should go to the guy himself, because those shells could change the outcome of the battle. Volker, he promised he'd make it happen. And he said, yes sir. Herm was approached by two disobedient soldiers and told that they had done 40 push-ups each. The young man said he had important tasks for these two. Do they know where the acid pits are, near the forbidden caves? The soldiers tensed up but said they knew the place. Apparently they had been there before. Herm said to take a few more boys and a rope with them. They were in for an exciting journey. Herm showed the young men a fearsome beast, a huge centipede. Volker and the others were very frightened. They were afraid of monsters. Why would the commander want to do that? Herm came closer to the centipede and asked why they were afraid of her. The young men continued to shiver. Cold sweat dripped down their throats. Why isn't their commander afraid of her? 
When the monster was brought in on a cart, the soldiers asked where to leave it. The commander told them to unload the cart next to the wall. That's where the centipede would belong. Volker asked what that thing was. Herm said it was an old friend they could still use. Volker brought the young man what he asked for. Herm said it was perfect. Just the right weight and shape. They were slingshots. Volker replied that the craftsman was proud of his work. Herm noticed that the craftsman had even left his mark. He asked his assistant for a slingshot to test them. The young man placed lead projectiles in the throwing weapon. The boy spun the slingshot properly and took aim. He wanted to test the new weapon in action. The centipede in the corner awaited its fate. Its dead grin continued to frighten everyone. They found a good use for it. The young man spun the slingshot properly and released it. The projectile flew into the target. The piece of lead went right through the centipede's shell, punching it right through. Volker asked what the commander thought about it. Herm said more testing should be done. And everyone should go through this training. Herm said to have Volker distribute the shells to the personnel. Everyone will participate in the test. Whoever's shell goes in deepest gets 10 merits. Volker asked if he could enter the competition. He was once the best slinger in his neighborhood. Merit wouldn't hurt him either. Herm replied, then Volker should show all the soldiers how it's done and let them follow his example. The young man thought that even the children of scarecrows could use a slingshot to get their food. That would be their advantage. Volker didn't do well. He was upset. Herm calmed him down. He said he'd get it right next time. You need a lot of practice in this business. The young man thought about it and turned to Volker. He had an idea. Volker, no longer sad, wondered what he could do to help the commander now. Herm asked to tell his acquaintance to make as many of these ammunition as possible. Just don't brand them, because they don't have enough time. Volker was pleased and said he would be sure to pass it on. The boy liked it when he felt needed. Gorza, looking at Volker, said, Looks like someone had a great day today. Herm said the day could have been even better if someone had let him buy a wooden door. Gorza pounced on her brother. How many times is he going to say the same thing? They can't afford to buy a new door. The girl cried. She was very hurt too. She told the young man what had happened to her today at work. The supervisor told her to calm down because she was working too hard for the merits. The boy didn't know what to say to his sister. He felt sorry for her, but he couldn't change anything yet. The girl jumped on her brother and screamed that it was really bad. It couldn't get any worse. The one who should want her dead from overwork told her to get more rest. The girl left her brother alone and turned away from him. The young man said, he knows his sister is working for two, but it's for their future good. The girl told her brother to leave her alone. She just wants to go to bed. She doesn't need anything else from him. The young man said he made the girl dinner. He wants her to relax. The guy didn't have time to finish his sentence. Gorza asked what that stench was. The girl looked into the next room and screamed in terror. There was fear in her eyes. Gorza turned away and vomited. Herm looked over to where the foul odor was coming from. He too felt uncomfortable. The boy saw that on the table was the head of the guy from Virga squad that he and Rack had let go. The boy said that they would have to buy a door after all. A man plays good music on his flute. The boy looks at him with wide open eyes. There is hot, delicious food on the table. The aroma of it is maddening. The baby is drooling. He's very hungry. The baby wants to eat it all. A woman, the child's mother, says her son is very hungry. The man who played the flute says, what has this child done to deserve food? Let him go and find his own sustenance. The man yells for the boy to know his place and look for food elsewhere. When he was a kid, he thought life was pain. His stepfather was a gang boss in their neighborhood, formerly a nobleman, now just a beggar. Looking at him, he saw his mother's past and his own mistakes. Many people hated his stepfather and took their anger out on the child. The kid got beat up on the street. Everybody was beating him up. And in his head was the sound of that flute. The boy grew to hate it. When the boy grew up, his stepfather sold him to a fighting pit to pay off his debts. Every night, the boy fought with other youngsters to survive. Even edged weapons were used. It was survival of the fittest. There was no room for pity or mercy in these fights. Each was like a wolf to the other. The loser begged for mercy and appealed for mercy, but it didn't work. The weak were not destined to survive. The boy grew up, fought in battles, and there was not an ounce of mercy left in him. The law was kill or die, and I could hear the sound of that flute in my head all the time. Where he lived, rat fights were commonplace. Rats fought for survival too. The neighborhood boys amused themselves by forcing hungry rats to gnaw each other's throats for food. The young man saw himself in those rats. He also danced to other people's tune to live a little longer. But one day he saw something. A child was pushing one rat forward 
torturing it and urging it to fight. This rat did something different. It jumped out of the cage and clung to the hand of its abuser. The young man was amazed at what he saw. The guy saw the animals fight back, and he understood. If even animals resist their slavery, why couldn't he resist this one? The rats knew they couldn't win, but they tried anyway. And they died as rats, not slaves. The boy thought, if such small animals have so much courage, why shouldn't he have it? Even if he suffered, even if he died, so what? He swore that day that he would only live by one rule, his own rules. If his parents had seen a little farther than their own noses, they would have foreseen this outcome. The young man didn't poison them, he just put them to sleep. They tried to teach him the laws of this world, and so the guy took everything from them. He had his own set of laws that he followed. The guy took his parents' power, their lives, even their skin. The young man shouted that today everyone had witnessed the demise of the old pig. He asked everyone who they were now serving. The flute music continued to play in the guy's head. The guy shouted one word. It was a name, Virga. The young man's eyes shone with hatred. He was filled with that feeling. There was nothing good left in him. Virga grew up and started playing the flute, like his stepfather. It became his favorite pastime. The man's gaze is cold and penetrating. It was hard to bear. You could tell from it the cruelty of the man. The young man couldn't stand that look and apologized to his boss. Virga said he was listening to Oswald and put his flute on the table. The young man said his boss was right. The assumption was confirmed. Oswald said that Helmar is a traitor. This is already known for sure. Virga showed no emotion. He said, understandably. There was an icy coldness in his eyes. He didn't say another word. Virga had clay figurines of his warriors. It was quite a collection. Virga took one of the statuettes in his hand. It was a statuette of Helmar. Virga said it's too bad, that's all he said. The man had made his final decision. When the young man took his father's place, his men were the ones around him. To survive, he needed his own people whom he could trust. The young man began to select such a person. He looked for devotees. Helmar was the first of the ten he had brought close to him. This guy seemed trustworthy. He thought he'd make a good one. A forgotten bastard from a noble family, practically the same as him. He shared his view of the world and his interests. Guy began to teach this young man a lot of things. He helped him get back on his feet. They secured a new home together. They did it the hard way, based on their view of the world. The young men had secured a new future for themselves, which was achieved through blood and murder. They paved the way with brutality and weapons, and there was no mercy in their hearts. Helmar was like a son to him. Helmar was his firstborn son. Virga put his hand on Oswald's shoulder and asked why Helmar had done that. Oswald, shaking with fear, said that he did not understand. Virga said to Oswald not to kid himself. When the boss appointed him and Haim as his right and left hand, Helmar had two choices, agree with the decision or oppose it, and it was only natural. When he picked it up, he made it clear that the world was far from being a rosy and welcoming place. He wanted to convey to everyone that if they wanted to do great things, they should not rely on laws and morals. Only God should be above them. Virga concluded that what you sow is what you reap. That's the result. Oswald asked his boss what they should do now. Virga replied that Oswald need not worry. The stage was already set. All they had to do was wait for the performance. Oswald now understood why the boss had asked Helmar to send Herm's head. Virga said it was exactly like that. Oswald got it right. Oswald wondered if using the heads of the Pogue family was an overkill. Virga said he was a deserter. That's the way it should be. Since the Pogs are not shy about committing crimes if it suits them, but sooner or later there's a price to pay. He thought he could get rid of his past. He never ordered women to be killed or raped. They did it of their own free will. But when the time of reckoning came, they began to accuse him of all their sins. Oswald noticed that the boss never stopped them. Virga said, of course he didn't stop it. If he watched everyone, they would never have grown into such a large organization. Though dishonest people can sometimes be useful too. Oswald asked what about his children. Virga replied that they were already dead, but their short lives had value. While Helmar dealt with them, Bolo managed to rescue Pog's wife and daughter. Virga made sure they were in a safe place. That's all he could do. Oswald should tell Helmar to channel all his strength and crush Herm's forces. That boy has amassed quite an army. Time to see how strong it is. Virga played the flute. He wished Herm wouldn't disappoint him, if it was really him. A young man stands in front of a large gate leading to a cave. He hesitates to enter. In front of the entrance to the tent, there are guards armed with spears. They are wearing protective uniforms. The young man says that Cancer's men are blocking the other route, so the enemies have no choice but to go through the cave of the Corpse Eaters.
and that's where they'll be waiting for them. So the boy asks Volker what the status of the barriers is. Volker replied if everything goes smoothly, it will be ready in the morning. Everyone is working hard. Herm said it had to go smoothly. Otherwise, Helmar's army would turn them into a collection of corpses. Volker said he understood. Volker added that he's a little worried. People are scared. The enemy outnumbers them, and most of their people are holding guns for the first time in their lives. Herm asked what else Volker wanted to add to it. Since ancient times, warlords have offered prayers to the gods before battle. It seems to be the same thing everywhere. Even if it's nonsense and superstition, a young man came to the cave. He asked if anyone was there. Two green men approached him. He said he was expecting them. He wanted to meet the priestess Kataga. The man said that all those who wish to see the priestess must undergo a purification rite, and told him where the young man should go. The boy proceeded to the next cave. There was an old woman there. The woman said she is here to serve. The waters of Marin purify the soul. It must be drunk twice. The boy thought that with Marin water, it would be the same as last time. So he asked where he could get it. The woman said it was a gift from God. You have to fill a vessel with water that drips from the stones. The woman said the boy was impatient. The young man said he has a battle to fight, and he doesn't want it to start without him. The woman replied that most men try to avoid battles. The boy said that he was not one of the majority. The woman asked why this fight was so important to him. The young man replied that she would not understand. The woman said she would understand better than anyone else, because it is in the temple of Zia, the goddess of war. The young man said this battle will determine his future. If he holds on to win, he can try to make a difference in the world. And if he gambles, he and his men will be killed. The young man drew water and asked if the amount was enough. The woman said he could drink. The guy took a drink and shriveled up. It tasted really nasty. The woman asked, what exactly is the young man fighting for, if he is trying to make a difference in the world? The guy pouring water into a glass said he was fighting for justice. The woman said, the young man doesn't understand anything. Such things do not belong to the world. Peace itself is neutral. Justice for one is injustice for another. A solid circle that cannot end in any way but with blood. The young man remarked that this was strange reasoning for someone who served the god of war. Isn't her god bloodthirsty? The woman said that Zia only wants to bring the best into this world. Conflicts breed strong people. The boy said that the dead will not become strong. The woman replied that it was only for the winners. The guy asked if he said Zaya was insane. Would the woman take offense? The woman laughed in response. All gods are mad, she said. If they weren't, what would their world be like now? The young man asked what choice he had then. To run away, to exist as a worm. The woman said that the young man's heart is filled with rage. Because of this he does not see the real enemy. The gods will never oppose him, for he is doing their will. The boy finished the water and turned the glass upside down. He made it clear that he wasn't going to drink anymore. The young man asked the Katagi priestess who he should fight. The woman replied that he wasn't that stupid. The woman laughed. She had an answer ready for the young man. The young man said that the woman had pretty good teeth, especially for an old woman servant. The woman replied that she was not a god. The boy said, he doesn't care if she is a man or a god, he is ready to crush anyone in his path. The world that is made of blood, even after the changes, will be a world of blood and violence. What is the young man ready to choose, to resist the mad gods or to accept their will? The guy asked if she really thought he was a pawn in someone else's game. The woman asked the young man if he could prove otherwise. Herm said he'd had enough of this talk about faith. He'd had enough of it at the orphanage. The woman asked the departing young man if he wanted Zia's blessing for his army. The young man replied that her god should decide whom to bless. He still had a war to win. The aide asked Herm how it went. He replied that the god of war had said they should get together. The boy decided to think of something to say to his warriors. A young man stands in front of his army. He has something to say to them. Just then, someone announced that a priestess had arrived. The woman asked the commander if she could bless his army before the battle. The young man was surprised, but said he didn't mind. The priestess was wearing a mask. The woman addressed the warriors and called them the bravest. The goddess of war, Zaya, sent her here with a blessing. She would give them strength so that once and for all they could crush their enemies. The goddess has given their warlord a new name, a name worthy of the great warrior he deserves. The priestess continued, from now on, Herm will be called as Lion the Liberator. The guy was stunned. That name kept running through his head. The woman asked where Leo would come from. He's had enough of hiding in the shadows. He must show the gods what he can do. 
The warriors in the cave are at rest preparing their food. Someone wearing a hood is among them. Young men with injuries enter the cave. They have something to say. The young man said, There you are. A guy leading a wounded warrior. His head is bandaged. The bandage is bloody. The young man asked what happened to the guy. How it all happened. The guy replied that he shouldn't pay attention to it. Delk slipped and hit his head. The boss said he was clear. He asked me to keep an eye on this guy. The young man told the man to be careful. Helmar was in a bad mood right now. The boy thanked him and said he would try not to slip. Helmar asked if Haim had come to see the show. Haim asked if he thought he was being overly harsh on people. Helmar replied that it was only discipline, nothing more. The young man asked if he was being ignored too because of discipline. Helmar tried to explain something vaguely. It didn't work. He couldn't find the words. Haim said he didn't ask to be Virga's successor and asked what he should do now. Helmar shouted that the man could safely refuse, and nothing would be done to him for it. Haim was afraid Virga wouldn't let it go that easily. Haim asked what Helmar would do in his place. Helmar remained silent. He knew the answer. Haim said, exactly, and don't make a big deal out of it. Haim said he didn't want to lose him. Helmar asked if he was suggesting that he disobey Virga's orders and not attack Herm. Haim shouted, stop acting like an idiot. They both know what he's talking about. Virga knows everything. Helmar replied, of course he knows everything. Why else would he have sent him here? All of Virga's orders are aimed at spreading him at his feet. If they win, their fighters will be scarred, and they won't be able to stand up to Virga. And if they lose, there will be none left. Haim said that Helmar should go to Virga, and beg his forgiveness, and swear allegiance to him. Helmar put his hand on Haim's head and said that one leader leads to success, and two, to tragedy. Announced to have everyone ready. Helmar said, no matter what Haim and Virga thought, the scouts followed all of Herm's actions. Before noon, he would be defeated. Haim uttered one word, he said lion. Helmar asked him again what it was. Haim said, his spies had learned that Herm now called himself Lion. A priestess from the temple of Zaya blessed him last night and called him Lion the Liberator. Helmar laughed, that's some cheesy stuff. A Lion Liberator? Funny. Helmar said that Haim should warn his scouts to be careful. There might be other surprises waiting for them. Helmar added, May he be blessed by a hundred gods. He doesn't care. Helmar is certain that his victory is inevitable. Haim asked if Helmar believed he would become one of the enlightened ones. Helmar interjected in response as to why Haim still refused to accept it. Helmar the enlightened is a myth. A hero of fairy tales. Does he really believe that once upon a time there was a goblin capable of subjugating a hundred clans and creating one great one? A goblin capable of conquering everyone in the great forests. Helmar said that nothing is impossible for the chosen of the gods. Haim asked, then why he had left nothing behind? If he was so great and united everyone, why was there no trace of his greatness left? Helmar replied, he thought Haim knew his history. The children poisoned their father and then started fighting amongst themselves and destroyed everything their father had built. There was no one to preserve the legacy. The goblins know nothing but war. That's why they need a new enlightened one to restore the old order. Haim asked, and that person would be Helmar? Helmar nodded affirmatively. Haim asked what would happen to Virga then. Will he fight with Virga? Helmar replied that the world must change, and it doesn't matter who gets in his way. Helmar was ready to fight. He went out to his soldiers, fully armed. Helmar told his warriors that it was time to destroy their rival. The expedition is 10 days away. We must do it quickly. He asked if his men were ready. They all shouted that they were ready. Haim told his brother to take care of himself, and may the gods protect him. Helmar was determined to fight. His gaze was confident. The young man knew how to proceed, and he believed he could change the course of events. The warlord led his troop to meet the enemy. He was determined. The warriors moved in a smooth formation. They were all well-trained and superbly armed. The commander, as was his custom, led the way. Helmar raised his hand and stopped the movement of the squad. The warriors obeyed the commander's will. The sentry told the boss that the enemy had built barricades in the far corner of the cave, a few hundred kilometers away, and drew a detailed diagram. Explanation from Professor Gorza. Killigs is a unit of measurement in the goblin world. It is named after great ancient warriors who were about two meters tall. The warriors are preparing to repel the attack. They're standing in rows. They have barricades lined up. How many are there? Helmar questioned. Intelligence reported about 20. Helmar determined it had to be at least 30. We should listen to the other scouts. Helmar noticed that this part of the cave was completely blocked off. 
with only a bunch of old men and children in the houses around the edges. Let them hide there like rats. The commander said that's great. They just need witnesses to tell the others what's going to happen today. Someone shouted to the boss to look behind him. Helmar looked back. The scout was standing beside him. There was another subdivision on the upland behind. Who it could have been? Everyone shouted that it was Virga. Virga and his troop, fully armed and alert, watched from the high ground. One of the warriors asked why he was here. It was explained to him that he was here to make sure they would definitely win. The deputy asked Helmar, Why not have Herm join? The commander said it's a great idea. We need to find another 300 skilled fighters. It'll be a fair fight. The warriors eyed Virga's squad warily. They began to suspect something. Helmar asked what was wrong with their faces. Virga had come to see them win. Did they really think they could lose to a few dirty diggers? The soldiers smiled. It was the commander's phrase that gave them hope. They said they believed in their victory. The soldiers raised their weapons up and gave a friendly shout. They believed in their victory. Helmar said that was better, and called on everyone to show Virga what they were worth. The warlord was ready to tear his enemies apart. Volker told the commander that the enemy had stopped advancing. Herm said he could see everything. Then it's time to start negotiating. Volker asked if the commander would really go there. Herm replied why not. After all, it is a tradition. Volker stated that this is a waste of time. The enemy can launch an attack at any moment. Herm said if Volker ever wants to be a leader, he needs to remember one thing. Warriors are won and lost long before they start. One should always keep that in mind. Through negotiation, you can increase the chance of success. Volker asked in what way. Herm said he would provoke the enemy. The opponents were approaching each other. The distance between them was shrinking. The warriors were unarmed. 28. Helmar asked if you were Herm. He expected to see someone more impressive in front of him, not a short man. Herm said he would prefer to be called Lev. And who is in front of him? Helmar was surprised that Herm didn't recognize him. He turns out to be even more stupid than he thought. The warrior said his name was Helmar and he would be his undoing. Herm asked if Virga thought that one squad of Helmars would be enough. He suggested that Helmar go back and tell his master to send Oswald, Ludger, and Haimo in addition. Herm turned around and walked away saying that he didn't even feel bad about wasting time on Helmar. Helmar clenched his fists in anger. No one had ever spoken to him like that before. The warrior was extremely angry. He was ready to tear the little boy apart with his bare hands. Helmar called Herm a foul worm and wanted to punch him. But something stopped the warrior. He just laughed and did nothing. Herm stopped and looked back. He was surprised by his opponent's reaction. The guy asked, wondering if he'd said something funny. Something that would make Helmar laugh. Helmar says that Herm is trying to fool him with his childish tricks. When he crushes his pathetic rats he calls warriors, he will ask his new slaves to tell him why their warlord decided to do this. Helmar continued. Afterward, he would have them write a song for future generations, so that posterity would know that once upon a time, there lived a small, feeble-minded worm that he had crushed. At that moment, Helmar saw something. It startled him terribly. Fear appeared in his eyes. Opposite him stood Herm, a short young man. Zaya, the goddess of war, towered over him. Her mask glowed. Helmar was really scared. He didn't know what he should do next. The warrior stood at a complete loss. Herm left and told Helmar to pray to his god for forgiveness, because he wouldn't get forgiveness from Herm. Helmar sad and pensive returned to his squad. The aide asked the boss how things were going. Helmar wondered what it could be, what he saw. Then the warrior decided he was just imagining it all. Helmar announced that he would reward anyone who brought him the head of this short man. Helmar commanded, attack. Herm silently watched the events unfold. He realized that a clash was inevitable. The warriors prepared their weapons for battle. The sharpened blades glittered. To repel the attack, spears were pointed in the direction of the enemy. Everyone was extremely attentive. The distance between the rivals was shrinking. Herm's squad held the defense, positioned behind the barricade. Helmar's warriors were on the attack. Helmar commanded, let's go. The first one to break through the barrier will receive 20 merits from him. Helmar's shield was hit by a projectile from a sling. It was quite unexpected. The warrior wondered what it was. He clearly hadn't expected it. The projectiles from the slingshot continued to fly, striking his opponent. Helmar had not expected such a thing from his enemy. The warrior cried out in desperation. He had to do something. His squad was taking casualties. The balance of power on the battlefield immediately shifted against him. Herm towered over his squad. He stood on a barrel and silently watched the situation unfold. Helmar realized he had to act. He must lead the attack. 
his warriors would support their commander. Helmar shouted for everyone to follow him immediately. The warriors thought the enemy only had slingshots. There's no need to slow down. Helmar ran ahead of everyone. He shouted that the enemy must be destroyed. The deputy told Herm they seemed to have pissed them off. Herm continued, standing on the barrel, to observe the events. The young man got off the barrel and said, Okay. The commander told Volker to tell the slingers to fall back when they ran out of ammunition. The buccaneers should defend the barrier as long as they can. The guy said it was time to start the next phase. He had a multi-pronged operation prepared. Helmar thought with anger. Did the enemy really think some ironclads would stop them? Helmar shouted to his squad to spare their enemies. They didn't want prisoners. That's all Helmar's warriors needed. Their blood was pumping through their veins. They were not going to spare anyone. Wielding axes, Helmar's squad began to tear down the barricade. The wood cracked and splintered into small splinters. The rivals could look each other in the eye. The German warriors, protected by their wooden armor, began to scatter in fear. The opponent yelled for them to come back. Because it's time for his dinner. Something caught the warrior's attention. He looked closely. He had a piece of rope in his hand, smeared with something. The warrior wondered what it could be. Herm was standing in front of him with a lit torch. He wasn't going anywhere. The aide told Helmar that Virga was watching them, and they must not retreat. Virga and his troops stood a little farther away. They watched the battle from the high ground. Gilmar thought, let him enjoy it while he can. Soon it would be his turn. Gilmar looked back at some sound. What's that? He thought. Gilmar didn't believe it. There was an explosion. How could this have happened? His eyes once again filled with horror. The barricades exploded and caught fire. His warriors were engulfed in flames. They ran out of the flames screaming. Gilmar shouted that this could not be. He had lost his warriors in an instant. The aide looked at his commander. There was despair in his eyes. He didn't know what to do. The deputy asked his boss what they should do. Virga continued to watch the fighting in cold blood. The fire was burning in front of his eyes and he saw Helmer's warriors dying. Oswald said that they had missed their chance. Ludger told him not to jump to conclusions. The boys are already carrying water and blankets from the houses. Sooner or later, Gilmar will get through the barrier. Oswald told Ludger that no one would be saved. The warriors on the outside were carefully observing what was happening on the battlefield. The young man didn't realize it was still happening, where it came from. Someone said that the army of cancer had appeared. Rack and his squad, armed from head to toe, watched too as events unfolded. The warrior said he'd kill anyone who tried to escape. It's like a rat hole. The warrior offered a 20 on the short guy winning. His co-worker says he's terrible. Their brothers are in danger, and he offers to place bets. Warrior said Haim is the only one who doesn't believe in them. Oswald said he'd put a 20 on Gilmar. Someone else bet a 20. Gilmar's unit continued to advance. The aide reported to Gilmar that they had taken furniture from the houses. The commander told them to use it as shields, because the enemy still had ammunition. The lieutenant shouted, needing to think of something to break through the barrier. Gilmar called the opponents insignificant. All they know how to do is hide behind fortifications. Herm asked what their casualties were. Volker reported, two dead, five wounded. Gilmar lost almost a quarter of his men during the assault. That's why they're still holding up just fine. Although they still can't fight back in the open. Volker said people are worried about cancer. Herm asked me to tell you to worry about what's going on up front. The thing to worry about with cancer is when they lose. But it's not like they're going to lose. Herm said for Volker to keep the signal horn at the ready and act on command. Gilmar's warriors created shields that they used to hide from slingshots. Gilmar ordered everyone to raise their shields. They were about to reenact the attack. One of the warriors said that the enemy was beginning to scatter. They were afraid. Herm's warriors threw down the slingshot and began a chaotic retreat. Gilmar laughed. So much for showing their rat-like nature. And ordered them all destroyed. And the sooner the better. Gilmar's squad approached the Herm warriors, hiding behind their shields. Volker shouted that the enemy was coming, and we need to be more careful. Herm said he sees everything. And asked Volker if he knew the difference between a good leader and a great leader. Volker expectedly said he didn't know. He didn't feel like having this discussion right now. Herm said a good leader always makes decisions based on previous mistakes. Gilmar's warriors were getting closer and closer by the second. A great leader, looking at the situation from all sides, finished the young man. Gwimar was already celebrating his victory and approaching his opponent. Suddenly, Gilmar noticed that all his warriors began to stumble, fall, and stop. Gilmar himself screamed. A terrible pain appeared in the warlord's feet. He stepped on something, and the pain appeared in both feet. The warrior stopped and looked at his feet. The feet were bleeding. 
The warlord pulled a huge thorn out of his leg. It was covered in blood. His legs hurt so much that it was impossible to go any further, Gilmar shouted. Some of the warriors said they were in trouble. Gilmar shouted that he understood all that himself. There was no need to talk about it. The deputy said he was talking about something else. Look at the shacks. Another army was coming out of the shacks. They were still hiding there. And they were all armed. Gilmar's warriors were now surrounded. They had to escape at once. The soldiers urgently created a defensive structure out of shields and hid inside it. Gilmar's warriors hid inside the pyramid they had created. Outside, rocks and spears flew at them. They were surrounded. The ring around them was shrinking. Gilmar's soldiers had nowhere to go. They were completely besieged. It was as if they were in a small fortress. Virga continued to watch this fight in silence. Ludger said it looked like his bet had played out. Hymo stated that Gilmar is trapped. If he took some fighters, he could help him. Ludger said Gilmar lost the battle. Then he will die. There's no reason to save him. Hyma said that Gilmar is their brother, and they should definitely help him. How can Ludger say that? Oswald told everyone to be quiet, and asked Virga what they should do now. Gilmar, under the cover of the shields, wondered how this short man had gotten so many men. Someone said they saw Pog's wife. Gilmar was surprised and asked where she was. The warrior pointed in the direction and said she was standing with a red ribbon in her hand. And indeed, there stood a girl with a red bandage on her arm. There was hatred in her eyes. And there was also Karnak's father and sister Morna. The warrior thought he knew almost all of these people. Hem thought the kid was a few guys short of a full army. So he asked to save the families of those Gilmar was feuding with. And that's actually a lot of people. Some evil ant could put Gilmar down too. Rogue said Gilmar isn't dead yet. Hem said it won't be long now. He's already trapped. Rock said there's nothing more dangerous than a cornered beast. Gilmar's warriors noticed the lion approaching their fortress. The young man was unarmed. Why is he doing this? The commander, wearing a protective helmet, walked leisurely toward Gilmar's squad besieged beneath the protective structure. Gilmar didn't understand what the young man wanted from him. The lion was clearly coming to talk to Gilmar. Gilmar decided that this guy likes to talk. As soon as he gets close, he'll give the signal. After that, we have to break through and kill him. Gilmar looked out from his hiding place and said that the short man had decided to mess with them. In any case, he listened to what this warlord had to say. Lev said he wasn't here to talk to Gilmar. Gilmar wondered why he'd come here then. Lev said he came to talk to his people, and he hoped everyone would hear him. The young man raised his hand and shouted for everyone to listen to him. The boy said it wasn't their fight. Gilmar's warriors looked at each other. What does he mean? The lion continued. The rich men force them to wage war on each other. The best of them die here, on the battlefield, while the bigwigs bask and enjoy themselves in the sun. They're not his enemies. They're his brothers. He has no intention of maiming and killing them. The warriors listened intently to their opponent. The lion continued. He knows they were forced to come to this fight. They don't really want to be here. They want to be at home with their children and wives. Not dying in battle for those who don't care about them. The lion announced that anyone who laid down their arms would be granted life and liberty. One of the warriors didn't believe it and said it would never happen. As soon as they laid down their weapons, they would be killed immediately. The other warrior shouted that it was. Better to die trying to kill him than to die without a weapon in his hands. Gilmar stated that the guy was wasting his time. Virga will not keep them alive. All those who serve him are well aware that they can die in battle. The young man spread his hands. Why do they think Virga doesn't help them in battle? Because he wants Gilmar dead. Gilmar and all his cronies, the guy continued. Virga is here not to support them. Virga is here to kill them if they win. As long as Gilmar lives, they will fight and die for him. The guy's done. That's the way it is. And he sees two options. Either they all die here together. Either only Gilmar dies. There can be no other options at this point. The warrior asked Gilmar if it was true, boss. The soldiers began to hesitate. They said that Virga would kill them all if they didn't kill Gilmar. Maybe Virga only wants Gilmar. What should they do now? Gilmar was frightened. He said he would never do such a thing. The commander said he always did everything for his soldiers. Lev corrected him and said that Gilmar had always done things for his own sake. Gilmar realized it was a dead end. Gilmar had nothing to lose. He said the boy was a scoundrel, and he was going to come out from behind his defenses. Gilmar took a step into unprotected territory. There was hopelessness, despair, hatred in his eyes. Gilmar didn't get far. The spear pierced through his body. The warrior screamed in pain. Someone told the boss not to take offense at him. He has kids, and everyone started saying it was all Gilmar's fault. The commander was still holding his weapon. 
He could not believe that his soldiers had betrayed him. Gilmar turned toward his soldiers and shouted that they were traitors, and he was going to kill them all himself. Gilmar cried out loudly in despair. That's what he felt he could do to him. Gilmar remembered the day he had first met Virga, when he was just a child. Gilmar asked for forgiveness. The commander was dying, with many spears in his body. One of the warriors was about to cut off his head. After Gilmar's death, his soldiers said they were surrendering. Volker told his commander that Virga was approaching. The fighting was stopped. No one wanted to fight. The opponent was ready to surrender. Virga approached Gilmore's warriors, his face calm. He was acting cold-blooded. The lion also looked calmly at Virga's approach. Not a muscle in his face quivered. The young man sat on his knees and cried. He did not want to die. The young man held his sword forward and said he would gut everyone. And he'd start with him. Virga told him to stop. The boy had hatred on his face. The young man shouted that this guy was a scoundrel. It was because of him that everything happened. Virga pointed his finger in the other direction and wanted to explain what he meant. The young man looked in that direction with surprise. He had not expected this. Standing near the lion were Rack and his soldiers. They were determined. This was the young commander's support. The lion had won this battle unconditionally. The young man felt victorious. Cancer gave him his support. Virg made it clear that further action was pointless. We should leave it as it is. Virga turned around and gestured for his warriors to leave. Nothing more would happen today. The lion looked silently at the departing Verge. He knew it would end this way. The young man spread his hands. He had nothing more to say either. Volker said, why isn't the commander having fun? I mean, they won. Lev replied that it was only a small skirmish. The war was yet to come, and they wouldn't get off that easy next time. Volker stated that he believes in the best. After all, they won today and this victory is worth something. Lev said we could give everyone a drink. The soldiers deserved it. Volker said he would be happy to fulfill that. The lion has been told that they are in trouble. Cancer's men are taking all the loot and the families want to kill the prisoners. The young man went to the prisoners. He was not to allow lynching, and he didn't want to give the prey to the men of the crayfish. The lion shouted furiously for them to stop everything. This is not the way to do things. The warrior tells the runt to back off. They're just cleaning up after him. The lion said it was his leftovers, and the warrior can take his buddies and go, and wait for him to make a deal with Rack. The warrior told Vic to explain to the insolent man who was in charge. He went on about his business. Vic walked up to Leo and asked him if he happened to have a couple of merits, and told the young man to empty his pockets. Vic threatened him with a knife. The lion said that this warrior was not behaving properly. The lion lowered his spear and said he shouldn't do that. Vic headed toward the lion, pulling out his spear on the way, and said the guy asked for it. Vic didn't have time to speak and do what he intended. He received a powerful blow to the jaw. The lion was silently watching what was happening. The warriors standing nearby were also surprised. Knocked out Vic Hem. He shouted angrily what's going on here. The guy was obviously angry. The warriors who had just collected the booty were very frightened. They tried to justify themselves to Ham. Hem was furious. He attacked the soldier and told him to be quiet. Now he's gonna be on desk duty for a week and cleaning out the fighter's holes. The soldier was very frightened and was not going to cross the commander. He was no longer happy that he had started to do so. Hem asked, or maybe they wanted to patrol the caves where centipedes prowl. The warriors cried out in fright that they didn't want that, and they will not do it again. Hem asked then why they were still here. He told them to take their friend Vic and get out of here, and that he should never see them here again. The soldiers were leaving, and Hem kept yelling at them in their wake. Hem apologized to Lion. He said there are still some dumb soldiers out there. The lion thanked the warrior for his help and said that he would never forget it. Hem said he wasn't grateful. He wouldn't want to have to explain to their relatives later what had gotten them killed. The lion explained that he didn't intend to kill them. He just wanted to teach them a little lesson. In any case, he was grateful. Hem added that after what the young man had done to Gilmar, he was surprised those boys had the courage to stand up to the lion. Life teaches them nothing. Rack said Hem recruited them himself. The commander approached quietly. Hem saw Rack and apologized to him. Leo thanked him for his help. Cancer said it wasn't worth a thank you. But you're always welcome, Lion asked, meaning they won't be taking trophies. Rack said the deal was 20-30%, but after the battle he wants half, Lev objected, wondering if it was too much. After all, they were almost halved in number. He suggested 80 by 20. The commanders kept haggling. Each one stood his ground. Cancer said to Hem, This is what happens when you're overly generous. Everybody wants a bigger piece of the action. Cancer stated that Leo fought on his own and won with minimal losses. 
but without his support, it wouldn't have happened. So he suggested 50-50. The lion didn't stop. He said they had gotten rid of the enemy commander, and Rack in turn had not lost any men. So Lev agrees for 70 to 30. Rack said that Gilmar was just a little annoying. Nothing serious, Rack added. Plus he helped find the families of the victims. 40-60. Lion agreed that cancer had helped him, but he was the one who had convinced them to come here. So it's 70-30, and Rack can have Gilmar's axe. Leo and Cancer agreed and hit it off. This was an important part of the deal. While the warriors were arguing, the lizard decided to lug the breastplate away. The lion said it was a warrior's breastplate, and the man rushed to catch up with the animal. Rack shouted that the boys could collect the loot from the first barrier, and do it fast. Lev asked what about the prisoners. Folker stated that they were in detention. The families did not want to just let them go, but they have been calmed down. Although it's probably temporary, therefore the prisoners are in custody. Lion said, since the families were gone, we should strip the prisoners down to their underwear and let them go, and make sure Rock takes a third of the spoils. Volker said he doesn't like it, having to share the spoils. Lion said, and he doesn't have to like it. They work together as long as they have a common enemy. Volker asked what happens then when that enemy is gone. Lev said, then they would see who was stronger. But we should think about that only after the expedition. A young man is walking through a dark cave. He has a bag behind his back. There is a sound. The young man cries out in fear at who is here. He is alarmed. The guy loses his balance and pitches forward. The young man can't stay on his feet and he stretched out on the ground. The spear fell out of his hands. The boy sees what was the source of the sound. Wild animals are sneaking up on him. They're predators. The young man is scratching the bruised spot on his head. He had an unfortunate fall. Lev asks what Volker is doing here. The young man apologizes. The lion asks if he really wants to catch his breakfast. Volker spits and says that these creatures have a very horrible taste. The guy asked if his boss had tried these animals. The lion thought for a moment and said, I guess not. He had never tasted these lizards. Volker said he didn't have to do that either. When he was a kid, they had hard times. One time his mom caught and cooked them. They tasted like leather. The lion said he would remember those words. And he doesn't blame the young man for being scared here. Lev asked where all the workers and merchants were. It was already morning. W. Volker said anyone not going on the expedition is hiding out today. Lev was surprised. He asked the young man why this had happened. Volker said it's because of the goblins. When they come, they get a little rowdy. It scares the locals. Lev asked, it's something like hide the women and children, right? Lev explained that that's what they used to say at his house. They have to hurry. They don't want to get caught by the goblins. The young people continue their journey. At the bottom, they notice a strange glowing insect. Volker asked what was happening to his commander. He's not wearing a face. Lev said there was nothing going on with him. Volker noticed that his commander was different after the battle. He was now quiet and calm. Lev wondered if he hadn't always been like this. In his opinion, nothing had changed. Volker noticed that his commander was too calm now. A lion is always calm. But when he's too calm, it means he's angry about something. Lev asked what else Volker had noticed unusual about his behavior. Volker asked if his boss liked to smile. Volker said he was telling the truth, and the boss may not look at him that way. A lion always smiles. If he's not smiling, it means something's bothering him, or someone's bothering him, or he wants to kill someone. Lev thought about the young man's words. He didn't think he could be so predictable, and you could tell by his demeanor what was bothering him. Volker continued, he said his boss often gets pissed off by things that get in the way of his plans, or his sister. Lev told Volker to stop. Stop bothering him. This has nothing to do with the sister. Lion said Volker's walking on thin ice. He could get in trouble. Volker interrogated what it means to walk on thin ice. He did not understand the meaning of the phrase. Lev realized that he had said something unnecessary. How to explain to Volker what ice is. The young man explained that it was a saying. It means that you stick your nose where it shouldn't go. Volker said his commander knows a lot of things, and apologized for saying too much. The lion told the young man to be careful what he said next time. Lev thought of his sister, and said that Volker was partly right. He has a problem with his sister. His sister was furious that he had decided to pick a fight with Gilmar. She thought it was possible to avoid war with Vergai for the time being. Volker said that's his sister's nature. She tries to take care of the two of them. Leo has spent merit on outfits for the entire staff. For his sister, it's not easy. Plus, prices are going up every day, because the outside supply is down. That's what his informants told him. Someone is interfering with the transportation of food, and that could be a big problem for the Cancer and Virga groups. 
and for the Leo group too, because there could be problems with food. If prices go up, it will be hard to keep things under control. Volker said if Leo grew up with his sister, they could surely have other problems. Lev said her fan could be a problem. Volker asked which suitor we were talking about. The lion explained that it was a cake, a carefree guy from the minders. Volker asked if he really liked her. Lev recalled, they had just agreed that Volker would be careful what he said. The boy came to his senses and shouted, so true sir, he would be more careful what he said from now on. Lev continued, that guy cares about his sister, although he tries his best to hide it. But he's often too emotional, he thinks his actions could hurt his sister. Volker inquired, and what the young man says at times like this. Lev said that this guy at times like this says that her brother is just another thug who dishonors the name of the Greyborn. And it would be better for him to die, because he is like a leech sucking on his sister and does not let her live in peace. Volker offered to help the young man. When he gets back he'll round up some guys, they'll put on masks, and they'll pick this guy up. No one will recognize them. Lev looked at the wolfman. What the hell was he thinking? Where did he get that idea from? The boss said Volker shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. Volker persisted and said maybe that guy should fix his face a little, just to be sure. Leo said he appreciated the young man's enthusiasm and bright impulses to defend his honor. But it was best to leave him alone. Lion continued. That guy actually has good intentions. And the overseer looking after his sister makes him feel better. If something happens to him, he'll know his sister is safe. Volker said that if you look at it from this side, he now understands what's involved. Lev said he understood too, but he would like to spend his time in a more pleasant way before the expedition. Not to feel admonished by his sister and her bow. The lion said they were finally here. There was a cave in front of the warriors. We'll have to send a sentinel to report the situation. The young men lined up in a line. Volker and Lev clung to each other and decided not to part. The queue moved slowly. The young men gradually moved forward. The young man saw an old buddy of their family. The old man said, look at this. The old man heard that the guy had become very busy lately. Volker asked that it was Lion's foster father. Lev answered the old man, he did what he had to do. The old man asked if the young man was sure he had done the right thing. He had nothing against his gang, but his actions had gone too far. He should have told the guards instead of putting his men at risk. Volker shouted what they were saying to the guards. The old man wondered why no one had told him about it. Lev explained, because Virga had bribed the nobles. And after that, the nobles wouldn't let the old man interfere in the matter. The lion looked at the old man and said nothing more. The old man should have understood everything. Old man Cool said that the young man was actually right, and he lowered his head. The old man asked if the young man's father would be happy if he knew what he was doing. The young man remembered his father. Old man Cool continued. He doesn't know what the young man is going to do next but don't disappoint his father and don't become one of them. Lion said all he wants is to make the world a better place. That's what he promised his father. Old man Cool told the young man to take care of himself and wished him good luck. The young men moved on. They had to find more of their boys. Lots of people walking around the lower caves. There are some among them with orange armbands on their sleeve. The man watches those around him intently. His gaze is insular and penetrating. The young men are trying to barter or just sell something. The man told the young man to sell his trash elsewhere, or shove it in his mouth. The young man told the man that Alvi had lost his flask, and they were trying to find a new one. And don't mess up their deal. The man responded by saying that you have to be smart. This flask is made of barasa. It has a thin and soft rind that will rot in a couple or three days. He should find something better. Like an opasa flask. The man said that he had such a flask with him for two expeditions, and it looks as good as new. The guy looked at these young men and said they wouldn't last a week. The man agreed, but said it wasn't thirst that would kill them. The interlocutor motioned for the young man to look at the others. The young men gathered in bunches, everyone from Lion's squad stuck together. Guy asked if anyone had seen Lion or Volker. He was told they'd be late, because Lev lives far away near the overseer's house. One of the guys came up and told Mulg they were in trouble. Virga's men want to start a scuffle with Rack's men. That could end badly. Mulg asked if it was that serious. The boy replied that it was serious. After all, most of Cancer's people have not yet come up, and those who are here, they are in the minority. Molg said everyone here is following him. Rock supports them, so they'll support him. The young man asked what about the lion, they were going to meet him. Molg said nothing in reply. The men hid in the shelter behind a rock, and watched. They watched to see how events would unfold. The servants carried the chair on which the goblin was seated. 
Volker told Lion that this goblin fox had three heads. Lev stated that Volker really needs to pay more attention to his surroundings. Volker asked what the boss meant. These are neutral lands. None of the other teams can hurt them. Lev suggested that Volker should tell that to those who have been after them for a long time. Volker tensed and looked around. Could they really be being tailed? He hadn't noticed anything. Lev slapped Volker on the back and told him to keep his head down. If the pursuers find out they've discovered them, they'll attack right away. They've been following them since they came through the gate. Volker asked why they didn't attack right away. Lev suggested that the pursuers had a plan. Either the pursuers are waiting for them to be where they need to be, or they're going right into their hands. Volker replied that it all sounded kind of fishy. Lev asked what they should do now. Volker wondered why his boss was asking him that. Lion should be the one making the decision. Lion said Volker was his right-hand man, his job not only to follow orders, but to think through the situation himself. Lion had to be sure that when he wasn't around, their boys would be in good hands. Lev said to let Volker order what they should do in such a situation. The young man began to panic. How could he give orders? He had never given an order. It's not in his purview, especially since the boss is around. Lion said four behind them. Three on the right, three more on the left. Those are the ones he saw. They're using basic tracking tactics. True, there could be a lot more up ahead. Volker panicked even more. Why are there so many of them? Lev told Volker to keep calm, breathe deeply, and think that this was just a practice assignment. Volkerg followed his boss's advice. He started taking deep breaths in and out and repeating, calm, just calm. The boy began to listen. He held his breath. The young man suggested that the boss follow him. He had a plan. The young men began to make their way forward through the crowd. They tried to stay close to each other. Volker stepped closer to the goblin, who was moving around in a chair. The young men tried to hide between the porters who were hauling large crates. Volker asked if Lion could see the pursuers. The boss said it looked like they had fallen behind. They didn't risk attacking them. After all, the boys had mingled with the goblin caravan. Lion thanked Volker for a great job. Volker asked if they were heading in the right direction. Lion replied that when they got closer to the assembly point, they could run to it faster in case of an emergency. Wolfie announces that they are almost there. He could already see the rock near which they had agreed to meet. Lev asked where everyone was. He does not see anyone. There was no one near the stone. Volker tensed, stopped. He told his boss to look over there. The young men were surrounded by armed robbers with guns in their hands. They wore masks on their faces so that no one would recognize them. There was a guy standing on the dais with a sword in his hand. He said that if these two were looking for their friends, they were not here. And there's no need to expect help from them. He and Lion had one more unresolved issue. The young man looked at his opponent intently. The brigands began to approach the young men. The ring was shrinking. The boys stood back to back with weapons in their hands. They were ready to fight back. Volker shouted where the others were. Where their companions had gone. Why there was no one near the stone. Lev said it didn't matter now. Lev reminded Volker how they had practiced. They should have each other's backs, and everything will be fine. The leader of these thugs, standing on the dais, said that these two should be destroyed. A young man is standing with both hands around his book. He is looking at people passing by. He is in no hurry to go anywhere. The young man drew attention to an advertising poster that was located at a public transportation stop. The boy came closer, to get a closer look. Arcadia Academy was inviting you to join the fight today, and offered citizenship through service. The young man looked carefully at this advertising poster and thought, he had some strange thoughts in his head. Leo and Volker took either one. They fought off the advancing brigands. The forces were unequal. The young men were fighting off an invasion of armed fighters. They stood back to back, protecting each other and striking out at their opponents. A young man enrolled in a military academy. He became a cadet, decided to join the struggle and resolve the issue of citizenship. The boy had successfully mastered the art of hand-to-hand -hand combat. He practiced tirelessly, improving his skills the young man spent all his free time practicing his kicks on the punching bag. He showed success, to which others paid attention. The young man worked himself to exhaustion. He was dripping with sweat. The boy didn't spare himself in a workout like this. Working to the point of exhaustion, the young man would beat the pair until it was out of commission. The lion used the art of hand-to-hand -hand combat against the enemy. The armed brigands who decided to attack the young men, though they were in the majority. But there was nothing they could do. Lev put up a fierce fight. 
the young man had a spear that resisted the axes of his opponents, and that did not stop him from striking the enemy and doing damage. The boy was covered in sweat. His eyes burned with hatred. He wasn't going to give up. The young man was fending off simultaneous attacks from several opponents who were synchronously attacking him. The enemies continued to press on. They were all armed. It was very hard for the young man. The forces were unequal. The guy's been in combat battles. He had full protective gear. And with firearms, he was shooting at the enemy, using all his arsenal of knowledge. The young man participated in combat encounters, showing bravery and heroism. Fierce battles and the onslaught of the enemy could not stop the young man. At one point, the guy found himself surrounded by the enemy. He no longer had a firearm in his hands. The lion was losing strength. He was already crouching, leaning on one knee. The enemy continued his onslaught. The boy resisted with all his might. He could barely hold on. The young men managed to repel the enemy's attack, and they caused them considerable damage. The young men shook hands. They were up to the task. The broken spear withstood the onslaught of sharp axes and gave them trouble. Folker and Lev did not give up. They held on from the last of their strength and prevailed. They had an indestructible fortitude. The boy looked down on the blazing city. He had survived, and he was alive. The commander asked if Private Vanderstein was enjoying the view. He added that they were running out of time and to get the young man into the transport. The boy looked intently at his commander. His gaze was calm and confident. Tired and exhausted, Lev and Volker surveyed the battlefield. There were no opponents left. They had won this battle. Lion looked at the leader of this gang and asked what Haimo was waiting for. He's running out of time. Haimo Esses looked at the young man with hatred. The friend took Rafa's hand and told her to go faster, or they might not make it in time. The girl looked at Rune, wanting to say something. She was surprised. Some man caught the girl's attention. The man turned around and the girl stepped back. She hadn't expected to see him. Rafa asked what he was staring at and told him to mind his own business. The man looked sternly at the girl but said nothing. A friend said wherever they are, they make friends everywhere. Rafa said they were almost there. The girls moved forward holding hands. There were many young people around. The girl's attention was drawn to some sort of showdown. There were two guys with spears in their hands. Around them lay the young men who had been defeated by these guys. Many people crowded around them. The girls were terribly surprised, even frightened. They couldn't understand how this had happened. What kind of a battle to the death this was. Leo and Haimo were settling their relationship with guns in their hands. The lion was tired. It wasn't his first battle, but he held his ground. Haim attacked his opponent with fresh strength. Haimo screamed that Helmar was like a brother to him, and he took him away. He won't forgive that. Lev stated that his brother was an idiot. He couldn't open his eyes and realize what was going on around him. Lev added that Haima should not be the same and get out of here right now. Haima was furious, and he did not listen to his rival. Hatred clouded his eyes. He wanted revenge. Volker called out to his commander. He wanted to tell him something. Volker thought he had lost his bag, but the next moment he found it. Volker said it's okay. He found it. Lev said he's counting on Volker. Volker said he would not let his commander down, and the commander, as always, can rely on him. The battle between the lion and Haim continued. No one was going to retreat. Lion himself couldn't stop this fight. Haimu didn't want to do it. The girls watched this confrontation with bated breath. They didn't know who to give the victory to. One of the girlfriends decided to encourage the warrior and shouted, Yay, come on, pretty boy, kick his ass. Rufa wondered why she was yelling like that. Wasn't her type the guy with the long sword? Her friend said she was talking about him. Rufa replied that she knew it. Her friend's enthusiasm was misplaced. The girl said to the man as if this mercenary understood something. The man replied that he understood more than the harem guards. One of the girls got angry and said menacingly to the man, does he really have enough to live for? Rufa told Runa to be quiet. Why does the man think the guy with the spear will win? He's a pathetic miner who barely has enough merit to buy new clothes. The man said these girls judge people by their coins like a book by its cover. That's what happens to people who spend too much time around silver and gold. Runa became even more angry with the man. Rufa watched Lion with all her eyes, watching him do battle and trying to look into his eyes. For a moment their gazes met, they stared at each other intently. It was only a moment. The girl shrieked in surprise. The friend asked what had happened to Rafa. The mercenary asked, Now have you noticed? Rafa stated that that miner was giving in on purpose. The girl looked at Runa and asked if she couldn't see it. Runa said she didn't see it. The young men continued to fight. The fight was intense. Haim was unable to defeat his opponent. 
The lion stared intently into Haim's eyes. He was trying to reason with his rival. To stop fighting. At some point, Lev ducked, made a distracting maneuver and knocked his opponent to the ground. He fell to the ground with a scream. The guy flipped over his head. He dropped his weapon, cried out, and remained lying on the ground. The girl cried out in surprise. The mercenary said it was an unequal battle. The spearman spent the whole fight studying his opponent and his movements. And the one with the sword just kept attacking him. Haimo raised himself to one knee. His opponent held the point of his spear in front of his face. The lion told the young man to let go of his grudge. And he would let him go today. The lion said, pointing the ball toward his opponent, that he was now finished. Haimo realized that he could not get out alive now. There was hopelessness in his eyes. The boy raised his head and looked into his opponent's eyes. Haimo told the lion that he was the one who was done with him now. There was no fear in the young man's eyes. Many more of Haimo's companions appeared around the young men. All of them were armed. The young man said they still haven't learned anything that way. The guy added that his offer still stands. And he's offering to surrender to Haimo. Haimo asked why he would surrender. Lion said because he's running out of reasons to let his opponents live. Haimo laughed and said that Leo himself should reflect on the situation he was in. Suddenly the young man heard something. He asked what the sound was. The lion smilingly pronounced that it was the cavalry. To the young man ran his entire troop. All of the lion's warriors were pulling up to where the young men were fighting. The masked thugs that were with Haimo realized that they had to run away immediately if they wanted to stay alive. Haimo realized that she had finally lost, and his companions were fleeing. If he did not follow their example, he was about to die. Lion tossed his opponent's sword in the air and thanked Haimo for fighting. Haimo was very angry. He hadn't accomplished his goal. The young man considered himself a loser. The girls and the mercenary watched Haimo run away. The boy started the fight, only to lose it. The man said it was cleverly thought out. The girl asked what he meant. The man said the scarecrow used his horn to rally the others. While one fought, the other called for help. The girl said that the Greyborn are not that smart. The man added that these are smart, and that's worth recognizing. The girl was still saying something against the Greyborn, but it didn't matter anymore. The girl told her friend it was time to leave. It's getting boring in here. Rafa didn't want to leave. She continued to watch the young man. The lion was memorable to her. The warriors who had arrived to help were embracing the lion and his assistant. They were celebrating their victory. Lev noticed that a girl was watching him. Their gazes crossed again. Rafa continued to stare at the young man. Her friend pulled her to the side. One of the warriors told the lion that he had sent the boys to pursue the attackers. The lion asked them to come back. If the goblins found out what had happened here, they'd be in trouble. The deputy asked, is that why the boss didn't kill him? Lev replied that you could say that. It doesn't matter now. Lion asked Jem why he hadn't met them here. Jem explained. Because Virga's men had gotten into a scuffle with Cancer's gang. So they decided to help. Actually, there wasn't much of a fight. The lion said, but it was enough to lure them in. Now the puzzle was coming together. The man said when they heard the sound of the horn, they immediately went to help. Leo said he hoped Cancer's problems had been solved. The man said that when Rock and Hem arrived, Virga's men retreated. Lev said he understood. The young men were approached by a man who had just been talking to the girls. He wanted to talk to Lev. Leo inquired as to how he could help the man. The man said his name is Gozag, and he wants to commend the young man for this fight. Gozag had been on many campaigns, but never had he seen such skillful fighting. He would like to know the young man's way of fighting. The man said he was a participant in many campaigns and in different lands. Lev told Jem to track down some mushroom cider. They don't want to be rude to their guest. Lev shook Gozag's hand and said they had a lot to talk about. At the beginning of time, Jom, the All-Father, fought the Wanderer of the Abyss. And he lost that fight. After that, the whole world plunged into an abyss of madness. But from a drop of Jom's blood, a new god was born. The name of this god was Zaya. She was the one who was picking up the remains of a defeated god. And then forced Dorn, the god of death, to revive Jom. As a reward for his services, the All-Father granted Z the title of Greatest General. She went on a quest to take back the lands that the Abyss Wanderer had taken, and became known as the Goddess of War. Zaya also traveled to the Underworld to retrieve Jom's soul. The speaker said that they would travel to the Underworld to reclaim what was rightfully theirs. He said they must have heard that this expedition was needed to clear the Caves of Hevelings. But that was only half true. The real goal is to find ancient treasure treasure that others were afraid to take. All standing here are the lucky ones being honored. For this is not just an expedition, it's a real raid. They will go down, take what's theirs, and be rich. 
and it doesn't matter that they're scarecrows, or Dekka, or Berg, or Dargs, or goblins. Everyone who comes here will become part of history. He's calling them to come with him, and fight, and win, and triumph awaits them. They begin an expedition in the name of Jom. All present raise their hands and chant, Jom. Lev figured it wasn't the worst speech he'd ever heard. Gozag said Bulgu is not like his brothers. He is very greedy and overly ambitious. He is the youngest son of a Jira chief. This expedition is a great chance to show that Bulgu is stronger than his brothers. Lev asked if Gazag knew why Bulg wanted to do all this. Guy continued, the heir decides to personally lead the expedition, doubling the number of participants, calling for mercenaries of different races as if he's going to attack someone. Plus they're going down, not up. So there's something in the depths that's important to him. Gozag said that Leo's reasoning was very wise. He promised to ask people he knew. Lion said he'd ask around too. And the sooner they find out what Bulgu really wants, the better chance they have of getting back alive. Haimo sits on the ground with guilty eyes in front of Virga. He feels guilty. Virgo told him to get out of his sight or he'd kill him. Virga turned away from the young man. He didn't want to see him. Virga told Oss that Haimo was under his command from today. If he wanted to be leader again, let him earn that right. Osorazil, he just wanted revenge for Helmar. Virga cried out, what if he had succeeded? What if Bulgu had found out about all this? How many heads would have flown if the Prince of Dajira had demanded atonement? How many more men he would have lost? Virga said he understands what Oss is feeling right now, and he shares those feelings. But now is not the time. Oz asked his boss when that time would come. What are they waiting for? Virga replied that the dungeon was large and much was hidden in its depths. The boss said to be patient. Their time would come soon. Professor Gorza talks about the classification of goblinoids. In the world where she and Lion live, there are several major races, including goblinoids. After the Einshard Empire collapsed into numerous wrecks, tribes founded by descendants of Einshard began to appear. This is how the goblinoids came to be. The Dargs, the most advanced goblinoids, they were traders, warriors, and navigators. But at some point they were conquered by the human republic of Brizalum. Then there is the Deka race. They are powerful warriors, horsemen and mercenaries, known throughout the lands for their nobility during battle. Although the Deka are goblinoids, they were not part of the empire. Goblin tribes are the most common race of goblinoids. They spend all their free time fighting internecine wars. The strongest tribe is the Jira tribe, which has subjugated the Scarecrow. There's also a race called the Bee Burga. They are known as excellent hunters and trackers. Their temperament is as unpleasant as their breath, but there are not many of them. At the bottom of the social ladder are the Scarecrows. Even between them, there are some serious differences. There are blue Scarecrows who are nobles. They act as intermediaries between goblin overseers and ordinary scarecrows. Many scarecrows can also be green because they have the blood of ordinary goblins in them. You can easily tell them apart. Goblins have a taller stature and their ears point upwards. The Cerro born are socially below the skirting board. Although their ancestors were powerful shamans, they now labor in the mines, doing all the dirty work that even the other scarecrows didn't want to do. Their people were enslaved by the Jira tribe many generations ago and now they serve them as slaves. Level one. Level, this is the dargs. The young men are looking somewhere. They seem to be interested in something. The young man didn't really like what he was being offered. He lowered his head. The girl is coming out of the tent. She's probably upset. She doesn't feel like talking. Out in the fresh air, she saw an unfamiliar young man looking off into the distance. The girl grabbed the young man by the scruff of the neck. The boy didn't expect it. The young man was Volker. He looked around startled to see who was behind him. The girl dragged him behind her. She didn't speak to him. The young men reached the cave, at the entrance of which there was rough vegetation. The girl offered the young man food in exchange for medicinal plants and various insects. The guy was explaining to her which mushrooms could be useful, which could be poisonous. The food made from these mushrooms was delicious and healthy. Level 2. Volker told Lev and the boys what had happened to him today. How he met with the dargs. Volker began to avoid the dargs. He didn't want to get in their faces. A guy is standing in a clearing with many glowing mushrooms growing around him. Above him is a huge mushroom. The warrior girl drags the beast she caught by its tail. She's looking for Volker. Volker skillfully butchered this animal. He was a real hunter, and he told her how to do it properly. The girl listened attentively. Volker is preparing a meal. The young people are talking animatedly. They are interested in each other. They are discussing different topics. The young people eat the same thing they cooked. It tastes very good to them. 
The warrior girl enjoys the food she has not yet tasted. They are developing romantic feelings. Level 3. The young man is probably telling the girl how his childhood was. The girl listens to him with interest. Everything the young man tells her seems unbelievable. A young man decides to catch an animal he ate as a child. The girl helps him. It's fascinating. Following the animal, they came to the den of these beasts. The girl drew her sword. She was ready to destroy them. The guy cooked this beast and offered the girl to try it. She didn't like it. She had never tasted such nastiness before. The girl realized how hard it had been for the boy as a child. A girl takes a bath in a hot spring. The guy delicately turned away so as not to peek at her. Young people are leisurely strolling through the forest. They are interested. The girl is talking excitedly about something. Volker listens to her with great interest. The boy's heart raced after the girl put her hand on his back. This had never happened to him before. The young people say goodbye. They promise each other that they will definitely meet again. The boy and the girl are going in different directions. They enjoyed their walk today. Level 4. A girl is cooking her own food. Girlfriends are discussing her behavior. The girl is uncomfortable. The girl remembers the young man. Volker left a pleasant memory of himself. The girl is partial to him. She has a slight blush on her cheeks. The girl's memory flashed back to the moments associated with this young man. How they met. How they spent time together. Volker enjoyed dating this girl, but he felt he wasn't worthy of her. So he hid. The girl was upset and left without ever meeting the young man. It was a sad story. The boy reproaches Volker for his callousness. He says the girl has a soft spot for him, and Volker's being such a jerk. The dogs fight the Hevelings with courage. Courage is in their blood. They cannot be intimidated by the sheer size of this monster. A girl warrior bravely attacks a giant monster. She bravely holds a sword in her hands. Heveling is defeated and bleeding. The girl has won this battle. Volker hugs his friend tenderly. He is very happy that they have met. The girl can't believe it. The defeated monster lies at the bottom of the cave. Volker and his comrade are ready to support the dargs. The girl looks at Volker in surprise. There is a mute question in her eyes. The guy holds out a sword to the girl, which has traces of the blood of a defeated monster on it. He says that the girl is a great warrior. The girl smiles, a blush appearing on her cheeks. She's happy. The girl is socializing with a young man. She has a family waiting for her. She's glad to see Volker again. Volker's friends are waiting for him too. The guy waves to the girl. He was very happy to meet her. The young man was in incredible pain. He bites down on the wood to keep from screaming in pain. His eyes are ready to pop out of their orbits. The lion said that the wound on his leg would heal soon. When the crystal glows blue, you should bandage it and add more nacolite to the burn site. This will help neutralize the acid. The lion looks around. He assesses the situation. The young man asked how many casualties there were today. The young warriors are healing their wounds. Defeated and dismembered Hevelings lay nearby. Volker said he asked the healers to come, but they refused. They said they didn't have to take care of the Greyborn, only if the nobles asked. Lion said, two months, four levels, and over a hundred dead. Old men play them like soldiers on a battlefield. Some things never change. The young warrior remained displeased. The lion did not like this state of affairs, and this attitude towards him and his squad. Volker said the overseers ordered them to start collecting the loot. They said so they wouldn't waste any more time on the wounded. The lion stood staring thoughtfully at one point. Injustice again. Who would take care of the wounded then? The young man asked if it was definitely time to collect the treasure. The lad had long wondered why the goblins had sent the scarecrows into the mines, for they were weak and not adapted to life in caves. Eventually, the young man learned that it was because of the crystals the scarecrows used for lighting. The surface races use them for magic. But there's a catch. For creatures not adapted to magic, these crystals will be poisonous when touched. But not to scarecrows. With an innate talent for magic, they can hold those toxic crystals and not worry about a thing. It all turns out that they are now working in the mines where Jira's tribe sent them. The crystals had to be made safe for others. This process is difficult and expensive. There's a new way, inexpensive. In early expeditions, it was discovered that the Hevelings were able to naturally process not only metal ore, but also luminous crystals, making them safe and suitable for building their hives. Since then, expeditions have been made in the name of cleansing the minds of monsters. But in reality, it was all about collecting those very crystals. Originally, the Hevelings were kept apart. But after the Great Hunt, everything changed. Now they and the Greyborn kill each other on sight. 
Now each of these specimens is worth more than a dozen Greyborn lives. Hem complains that he's getting sick of him. Rack walks on in silence. Lev asked Rack and Hem how bad it was. The young man sensed the reality of the situation. Hem said they lost ten tough guys. Rack added, they died because they were in a hurry. Even a kid could have spotted the ambush if they had scouted the area properly. Hem says he can't understand why they're here. He's sure it's not just the ore and rocks. Lev said, perhaps he knew, and pointed a finger in the direction. Virga was coming from the other side. He was not happy either. Oswald walked with his head down, and angry. Rack looked at Virga. He didn't want to meet him. The warrior gripped his axe tighter in his hand. Hem looked toward Virga with hatred. Rack said, he knows how Hem feels. We can't forget that there is a truce right now. And they are, for now, allies. Virga said hello to Rack. He asked why Rack was still angry with him about that test. After all, it had been years. Rack said he turned his best friend on him, and he had to be killed. Virga said that Rack hadn't learned anything that way. If he hadn't given him the opportunity, someone else would have given him the opportunity. That's why Cancer is betrayed by his own people. Rack wanted to attack Virga. Hem and Lion held him back. Hem yelled for the boss to stop. Lev said it's not worth it. Virga is provoking him on purpose. If he attacks, Bulgu will kill him. Virga kept calm and smiled evasively. Rack calmed down and said let it be. He realized he'd overreacted. Ruck said he was going to go check on the boys, and told him to take care of that boy, meaning Lion. Virga shouted that Rack could meet him whenever it suited him. His doors would always be open. Rack didn't turn around and gave his opponent the middle finger. He was already completely calm. Lion said Virga didn't come here to provoke them. There must be another reason. Virga said he knew the reason why they had embarked on this expedition so suddenly. Virga continued, the brothers had a showdown over who would be the next chief. The lion replied that it was already clear. Virga asked Lev if he knew how Bulgu wanted to win this war, and why they are tearing through the dungeon floors so rapidly. Lev said he was very interested to know that, that it took them a lot of effort and money, but they found it. It's a place that houses a mythical weapon belonging to Ainshard himself. Warrior asks Volker why the boss is so angry. Volker says he doesn't know. We should ask Jem. Because Jem was in charge at the time, the warrior wouldn't stop. He said Volker was the commander's favorite, and he must know something, because the soldiers are worried about the boss. Volker asked, and since when did they start worrying about the boss? The warrior began to remember. He wanted to name some date to Volker to get him off his back. Nothing came to mind. Volker replied that he thought so. And there's no need to muddy the waters here. The warrior said Volker was right. He was just worried that the boss would get angry at another goblin and drag them into another mess. The other warrior said, amused that he was worried about that. After all, all the fights, the boss finished with ease. The warrior said that Mulg should have stayed out of other people's conversations. It was none of his business. Ghoul wouldn't let up. He said the boss was hiding something from Volker. I guess Lion likes grumpy old men like Jem more than he likes Volker. Mulg grabbed Ghoul by the hair and told him to stop talking with his tongue. The last thing you need to spread is rumors and gossip. Ghoul said Volker can take it easy. He's not gonna talk for nothing anymore. Ghoul declared that his girlfriend would lay him on her beautiful lap where he could cry. Roga said, When are those little gray men going to shut up? They're not out for a walk, they're out on a reconnaissance mission. Volker apologized to Rog and said they'd keep their voices down. Ghoul's just a big talker, that's all. Roga said if they were discovered because they couldn't close their mouths, he would feed them to the Hevelings himself. Molg told Volker not to let Rog run roughshod over him. The Bergs are just like Roga, grumpy from birth. The mercenary said it's like when you're itchy and you want to scratch but you can't. That's how the Burgas feel all their lives. He'd be cranky too with a nose that big. Smelling Bana next to you all day. You'd go crazy. The man fell silent. It seemed to him that they were coming up. The expedition's scouting party. There were six warriors. Gozag said that the fifth level looked much better than he had imagined. He couldn't believe that such a place existed underground. This place was indeed very beautiful. It was like nothing they had ever seen before. And it's all underground. What are those hairy things? One of the warriors asked. They're hairy sponges. There's a whole bunch of them on this level, every step of the way. Jem had told me about them before. Gul asked, are they edible? Molg said Gul could figure it out. But Jem warned that they would trample anyone who came near their herd. Gul said he wouldn't bother them then. Volker asked Gozag how long it would be before they reached the rendezvous point with the expedition. Gozag said meaningfully that on this terrain, 
It's hard to tell how much further they have to go, but he was sure which way to go. Ban looked at the meter and said that it showed Kundun 230 paces to the nearest reconnaissance point. They had traveled only 3,478 steps if they walked along the creek, they would have about 6,000 more steps to go. Volker asked what was in Ban's hands, a talking box? Ban said the box doesn't talk, it only counts how many steps they've taken over time. Roga said they should move out. Volker asked Ban where he got the box from. He was curious about everything. Ban replied that he had gotten it when he was fighting pink-skinned men in the east. He had taken it from a certain druid. Volker repeated pink-skinned, druids tried to memorize. Ban wondered if he didn't know. That's right, his tribe never left this cave. Volker said it's no big deal, he doesn't know much yet. Bun said it was a big problem. How can he live in this filth for so long? With no sun and no sky. There are holes in the cave. Volker said he didn't know what he was talking about. Volker stated that one day they will be free. But in order to be free, they would have to become stronger. That's what Lev told him. Ban heard about the lion and thought Gazag had told him about him. But he didn't pay much attention to it. Ban thought he'd better get to know the guy. Volker suggested that Ban talk to his boss. And then he could learn a lot. For now, he wanted to know about the pink-skinned and the druids. Pink-skinned, stinking dumbasses who've infested the east like hevelings. Turn any corner and you'll see them there. Some time ago, they had run into them and got into a fight. There was no way to avoid it. The pinks had stolen their pigs, so they had to ask them to give them back. But then a troop of druids appeared and asked for the fight to stop. Druids are kind of like the local priests. They're always looking for ways to end war. That's their rule. Druids never fight, only defend themselves and try to make peace. That's when Bun saw this box, and they offered this box in exchange. Ban accepted. The bank recognized that this was his best deal ever. Thanks to this box, he saved a lot of time. Folker replied that it sounded good. He could use such a box too. Ban added, if they regained their freedom and were traveling and came across these harmless pink-skinned people, we should show them respect for their religion and traditions. In return, they will do the same. Gozag said there would be no such thing. The Republic of Brazilium would destroy them. The bank agreed. Volker asked what the warriors were talking about. He didn't understand a word. Bun said, about a bunch of arrogant skirt wearers who march everywhere and carry a banner. They burn to the ground all the temples in every conquered land and impose their faith. Ban called the Pinko Scoundrels Scoundrels. He said he would never work with them again, no matter what the pay. Volker asked, didn't Bun work for them? Volker confirmed and said he worked for the same clan of mercenaries. They've worked for everyone in their time. Volker asked, so it turns out on the expedition they're mercenaries too? Bunk and Gazag looked at each other in silence. Bun said it doesn't quite work that way. It depends on which way you look at it. Some time ago, they were hired to help Bulg's younger brother fight the Kur. But it turned out they were trapped. They had a numerical advantage. They tried their best, but they didn't have much success. Bulgu made a deal with them. They're helping Bulg, and he's gonna help settle things with Jira. That's how they ended up here. Ban still thinks that Bulgu told K. Kur where to find his brother. Ban continued. They agreed to the deal because they didn't want another dissatisfied customer. After working with the Blacillium, their reputation was badly damaged. They trained soldiers and were involved in several clashes. But they are still considered bad because of their tarnished reputation. The Republic was destroying temples, libraries, schools. They were replacing the culture of those they captured with their own culture, and after a while got colonies completely loyal to Brasilium, ready to serve the Republic. Molg said that sounds really awful, and asked Volker if he should tell Lev about it. Volker said he would let him know. Volker stopped, looked ahead and asked what Roga was up to. Gozag asked Rog where he was going. Gozag thought Roga had found something. All six warriors looked where Roga was looking. The warriors saw a caravan of hevelings far below. There were many of them. They were moving somewhere. Ghoul was frightened and said there was a whole army of hevelings. They shouldn't go there. Ghoul was terribly frightened. It was getting dark. Many were resting. The detachment had posted sentries for the night. Hem said they were heading straight toward the expedition. An army of hevelings. The hevelings have spotted a sentinel unit. Gozog said they were heading directly toward the expedition. Folker assumed they were going to launch a surprise attack. Ghoul asked and what they were going to do. Volker began to honk his horn. Ghoul was frightened and shouted what Folker was doing. Gozog snatched the horn from Volker and shouted that he was trying to kill them all. Volker stated that they should warn the others that the heveling army is on its way, even if they are attacked. Ban stated that he would kill Volker for an hour. 
Ghoul stepped between Ban and Volker and said the Hevelings oriented themselves by smell. If you blow a horn, they won't hear it, so it's no big deal. Ban asked Rog if any of the Hevelings had gone in their direction. Roga looked closely and said he couldn't tell for sure. Bun calmed down, looks like the kid's telling the truth. Ban calmed down and stashed his weapon in its scabbard. The man said that next time the guy should warn the others well in advance. After all, he's not the only one here. Volker responded that he took no offense and had forgotten all about it. Ban stated that they needed to hurry back and warn the expedition of the danger. Ban continued. The sound of the horn will alert them that something is wrong. But they would never know the whole picture. Judging by the number of Hevelings, it would be a massive attack. The Sentinel squad was wondering how they were going to get back now. Bun said that Raga was a better tracker. Would he be able to guide them back without the bugs finding out? Roga said his big nose would try. He will use his sniff to pass unnoticed. Bun said he'd treat that nose to plenty of mushroom ale. If they come back alive, Roga replied that he was satisfied with such conditions, and he would do his best. The Sentinel returns to the expedition by uncharted paths. Roga leads all the warriors behind him. The young men are tired. They have been on the road for a long time. They need to take a break. Roga decided to take a break. Everyone collapsed exhausted. The young men could hardly breathe. Ghoul said he had no more strength left, and he can't go any further. This is torture. Volker said they would take a short break and move on. Ghoul apologized to Volker. Volker didn't understand, and asked Ghoul what he meant. Ghoul said he didn't have to convince Volker to join Lion's squad. Volker said Ghoul doesn't have to worry, he's fine. Thanks to Ghoul, Volker was able to tell his parents, no, and he'd still be sent on the expedition. Only he wouldn't have been as trained. That's why he owes Ghoul his life. Ghoul thought, and told Volker that if you look at it that way, he's right. Ghoul joked, maybe then, Volker would run slower when running away from the Hevelings. The young people laughed heartily. It helped them to diffuse the situation and relax a little. Ban said he didn't hear a response to the sound of Volker's horn. Volker noticed that he hadn't heard either. Perhaps the other group was far away from them. Ban stated, perhaps they can't answer, or what they saw is not the only Heveling unit, so maybe the other units are already dead. Volker said then there would have been a ruckus. He didn't hear anything like that. Ghoul added that there is still a chance. Volker said in that case, we need to hurry up. The Hivelings appeared nearby. They didn't see the sentries, but the sentries saw them. Ban quietly told Ghoul that the kitten was going to end. Ghoul asked which kitten he was talking about. Ban replied, the kitten that makes more noise than Ghoul, if that's even possible. Mulg wondered why these Hevelings were here. Maybe they're guarding something. Hevelings aren't smart enough to protect anything. Volker said he doesn't know why the Hevelings are here. But here is the only way to get to the expedition before the Hevelings do. We have to try to get past them somehow. Gozag said there are two options. Either someone alone distracts the bugs, or they all fight them together. You have to choose one of those options. Volker and Molg began to ponder Gozag's suggestion. Both options were not good, and risky. Volker said he's the fastest one here, so he'll take the Hevelings, and the rest of us will alert the expedition. Ghoul said, Volker, however, realized he was joking when he asked him to run slower. Volker nodded affirmatively, and said that now was not the time for unnecessary talk. We must act quickly. Gozag asked why Volker chose this option. I mean, it's very dangerous for him. Volker replied, he doesn't want his friends to die before him. He hopes to escape the Hevelings. Molg countered. The Hevelings move faster than they do. Volker wouldn't have a chance to escape them. Better the mercenaries distract the bugs. Ban confirmed it. He and Gozag can handle one Heveling. Volker noticed that there were three Hevelings here. Sooner or later, they'll run after them anyway. Hevelings are scent-driven, so the only way to get further is to entice them with scent as far as possible, so that the others have time to run. Volker confidently said he was up to the task. The Hevelings were in the same place. They were at a fork in the road, patrolling the place and sniffing around. Volker said goodbye to the team, said he'd do it. The others should be sure to alert the expedition. Roga put his hand on Volker's head. He was worried about him. Volker asked what he wanted. Roga said they know Volker is not a coward. You don't have to be a fool. Volker tried to justify himself. He's not a fool at all. He cares about his comrades. Bun noticed that the big guy was right. Volker doesn't need to prove anything. They approve of his initiative, but it's necessary to save his life for future great deeds. Ban added that they will all fight together. All the wars were silent. They realized that this was most likely how it would be. Volker thanked all the warriors for their support. Roga said he's taking the one on the left. The warrior was already preparing to attack. Ban stated that he and his co-worker would take the one in the middle. 
Gul was startled. He asked, This isn't a joke. Roga said, Fight or be eaten by them. Volker told Gul to remember their training. They had practiced this repeatedly. Gul said that in the trainings he was with the slingshot. Molg told Gul that they'd make it. They're outnumbered. The Hevelings smelled the warriors and prepared for battle. Roga, as he said, immediately attacked one of the Hevelings and wounded it. The beetle showed green blood. The mercenaries attacked the other Hewling. They acted coherently and prevented the insect from doing anything. Three small, gray-skinned men pounced on the third Heveling. Volker shouted for them to aim for vulnerable spots. The warriors were skillfully attacking their opponent with their weapons. At one point, Volker stumbled and fell. Warrior told Volker to pay more attention. Molg told Gul to focus and stay focused. Volker can handle it. Gul was the smallest of the gray-skinned men and of the whole crew. He was very scared. He was afraid they wouldn't make it. Molg attacked his opponent and shouted for Gul to help him. Heveling proved to be very aggressive. Gul's tears were flowing from fear. He held his spear in his hand. Volker continued to lie on the ground. Something serious had probably happened to him. Molg attacked the Heveling without stopping. He wielded his spear skillfully. His opponent could do nothing to him. Volker lay there thinking, he doesn't want his friends to die before him. He needs to get up and keep fighting. Heveling snapped his jaws right in front of Molg. The boy dodged. The fight went on. Ghoul, with a fierce shout, pounced on the enemy from above. He swung his sharp spear over his opponent's head. Ghoul thrust his spear right into the Hewling's vital spot and shouted that he had succeeded. Molg said he was good and that he should run around his opponent on the right. The two warriors successfully attacked the Heveling. The insect could do nothing against its enemies. Heveling was losing strength. The injury was serious. He had lost a lot of blood. He didn't fight back so much. The young men finished off their opponents with their weapons. The blood of the Heveling splattered in all directions. Ghoul shouted furiously and didn't stop for a second. He kept on striking blow after blow. Volker took his comrade by the shoulder and told him to stop. Heveling was already dead. Ghoul turned exhausted and asked his comrade, had he made it? Volker said Ghoul did a good job, and he did an excellent job. All three Hewlings were amazed. Each member of the team did well, and they won. Volker said they'd made it, and now they will be able to warn the expedition. The expedition continued on its way. The warriors moved along the established route. Those ahead noticed a large army of Hevelings in front of them. The expedition and the Hevelings were closing in on each other. There were sentries moving ahead of the expedition. They were the Greyborn. They were talking among themselves. The members of the expedition had no idea they might have a big clash ahead of them, with a huge Heveling army. Rafa and Runa were walking side by side. The girls were suffering from mosquito bites. Their whole bodies itched. The girls were wearing body armor. Rafa helped Runa scratch her back under the protective gear. Runa thanked her friend. The girls acted carefree. Runa noticed that this armor was very impractical. Who decided that armored bodysuits were useful? Rafa noticed. And if the girlfriend wants to wear something better, she'll have to become the gentleman's maid. Then we must seduce him. Runa said she was disgusted. It's better to take the bites. Rafa said the problem was solved, and Runa agrees to be bitten. Runa said that Rafa is her ray of light in a dark kingdom. That's why she loves her friend. Rafa replied that when they get out of this jungle, they will all feel brighter. Runa said she wouldn't get her hopes up, because they say it's even worse on level 6. Rafa replied regretfully, how could it be otherwise? After all, they all need it badly. More deaths, more bugs. Rune looked away and said Rafa's favorite with them by her side. The girl smiled and winked at her friend. Both looked at the young man. The lion was walking in full uniform. He was calm and cool-headed. Rafa blushed, but she got angry at her friend and told him he wasn't her favorite. Rune smiled and remarked that this was why Rafa talked about him at the first opportunity. Rafa excused herself and said that the young man is just a good fighter. That doesn't mean she likes him or that she trusts him. Runa wondered what she had against this young man. It seemed to her that these guys were disciplined and skillful and had always been kind to them. Rafa said they're a little too kind. That makes me think there's something fishy going on here. He smells funny. He's more of a merchant than a mercenary. Runa stated that this guy couldn't possibly be a merchant. They've both seen how skillfully he fights. Rafa said, that's what I find most confusing. Who can wield a spear and a word equally well? Runa noted that her friend was obsessed. Why don't she approach the young man and talk to him directly? Rafa blushed even more. She was embarrassed. She didn't know what to say to the young man. Runa started telling her friend about how long ago she used to guard the piggies in her home village. 
and she wanted to tell her friend about the cute little farmer. Rafa stopped in surprise. Something caught her attention. She became alarmed. Runa asked her friend what was wrong. Rafa said, apparently there was something up ahead. The warriors moved forward. The lion was running among them. He shouted that the hevelings were attacking. Everyone must gather at once. Rafa drew her sword, got serious, and shouted to her friends to get ready, and they must protect their master. The girl looked ahead intently. She was alert. Bulgu stood up and sniffed. He tried to pick up foreign odors with his big nose. The girl asked what was wrong. Bulgu said he can smell a strange odor up ahead, and it seems very suspicious to him. He thought it might be the scent of the hevelings. So there was a battle ahead of them. The friends were tense. You could see from their faces that they were extremely focused and ready to defend their master. One of the warriors cried out for help. Something white and sticky grabbed him and pulled him upward. Runa pointed her finger at him and asked what it could be. The girl was surprised. Everyone was screaming ambush. The whole expedition was ambushed. The warrior was caught in a spider's web. Huge spiders were casting out webs and trapping their victims in them. The spider attacked the young warriors, wanting to entangle them in its web. The soldiers defended themselves against it by putting their shields forward. The insects were huge. It was not easy to resist their onslaught. Runa fought back with her sword as best she could and defended herself with her shield. Rafa shouted to pierce their legs. That was their most vulnerable part. Rafa plunged her sword into the paw of one of the spiders with all her might. Blood spurted from under the blade. The other warriors did the same. The beast was sprawled on the ground and could not move. The soldiers wielded their weapons skillfully. Rafa stepped in front of the monster and swung her sharp blade. The girl thrust her weapon into the spider with all her might. The splashes flew in all directions. The beast was defeated. Rafa told her friend that they should help the others. Runa looked at her friend and said she better wash herself off. Otherwise, she'd be badly burned. Rufa, looking at herself, said it didn't burn. Afterward, the girl said he had a problem with his head. The next moment, Rafa fell face down. The last thing she thought was that she hated her armor. His father died in a bout of storms. The son of the village head tried to rape his sister. In response, his father chopped off his hand. When a tribal elder gave him a choice, either cut off his own arm or fight. The warrior chose the battle. It was the fiercest of fights. The warrior lost this battle. The price to the family for such an act was either death or slavery for the next three generations. But the chief got tired of the blood and instead of choosing, he simply banished them. They met Jira's troop in their second week of wandering. There were too many of them to fight them. Her uncle died protecting them. Her mother and sister were sent to a wish house. Her Ajin clan was dark and considered the unenlightened legacy of Einshard. But they were born to fight. They trained their whole lives for battle. Rafa thought her destiny had arrived. But it turns out it wasn't over yet. The girl woke up inside the web. She couldn't move. She couldn't feel anything. Someone told her that if it were her, it would be better not to move. The girl asked who was here. Her eyes were blurry. On the other hand, someone had told her that the paralysis would pass soon. She'd better save her strength for now. The girl didn't understand anything. She asked where she was and what had happened to her. She was asked what was the last thing she remembered. Rafa replied, she remembers fighting the Hevelings. She remembers how one they destroyed. The girl asked how many her interlocutor had destroyed. She was told that Leo had killed four. He and Cancer had killed three. The warriors were webbed to the wall. There were many of them. Virga seemed to have killed three as well. Virga was as calm and cold-blooded as ever. His face expressed no emotion. Virga said that Himgal is as always very polite to the girls. Hem responded by telling Virga to shut up. Virga calmly said that Raku needs to do a better job of teaching manners to his pets. Hem replied that when he was free, he would teach Virga manners. Hemgal and Virga continued their verbal altercation. Rafa decided that almost the entire expedition was here. The lion noticed that not everyone was here. Only those who had gotten spider blood on them are probably here. The girl calmed down. Thank the gods, she thought. Rafa was slowly coming to her senses. The lion, who was not far from Rafa, asked the girl if she was glad her big hairy boss was okay. The girl snapped back, I wish the young man would worry about himself. The girl stated that she didn't care. If the Hevelings ate her boss, she wouldn't care, as long as her girls were safe. The girl wondered if no one was going to eat them. It was a faint hope. Lev said he hoped so too. He doesn't think the spiders were trying so hard for a simple snack. The guy suggested the girl look around and tell him what she sees. Rafa said she could see the lion and everyone else. And something else caught her attention. Rafa noticed that there were rocks flying. How is that possible? 
Hum noticed that was exactly what he was talking about. Verga said he was beginning to fear for the future of their race. I wish Hemdal had kept his mouth shut. The warriors noticed a rock flying and a heveling nearby. At the seventh level, the laws of nature ceased to apply. Hem said, that can't be. He was very surprised. Verga said it might very well be. And he suggested that Hem should get clever. The Hevelings led them deep into their territory. Hem stated they're bugs. They can't act that smart. Rafa remarked that it was probably instincts. Lev doubted it was instinct. Had their instincts allowed them to ambush and capture half the leaders, they had simply underestimated the Hevelings. And most likely they weren't just ordinary common food for the queen. Hem and Verga agreed with the young man. What are they gonna do now? They have to find a way out. Verga told the girl to calm down. They already had their plan. Verga looked at Lev and said that he had no doubts about the young man. Lev winked at his interlocutor. Verga asked Lev once again if he had a plan. He said he could see in his eyes that the young man had thought of something. Lev asked Verga if his paralysis had already passed. Verga nodded affirmatively. He felt much better now. And can move his arms and legs. As much as possible, Lev said. Then he could fully experience what the Hevelings would do to him. Everyone was startled and looked in surprise at the lion. Verga asked what he wanted to say. Lev smirked and said he had no plan, and he could not be counted on. Hem said indifferently, so they're doomed, and there's nothing to be done about it. Leo agreed and said, it looks like it. Lev added that at least Verga would be able to settle the last case, right before the Hevelings devoured them. Verga wondered, what was the last case we're talking about? Lion said that, from the story, Verga liked to beat Hemgel on the head. Lion continued, because of this, Hemgel broke off all relations with Verga and went to cancer. But that's not all. If Hemgel had heard what Verga's cronies were saying about him, he wouldn't have left it at that. Hemgel was horribly surprised at Leo's words. He had heard nothing of the sort. Hem shouted that he would get his revenge on Verga and would not let it go unchallenged. Hemgel shouted that Verga was a coward and he's being sneaky. Verga said he didn't even need his hands to get even with Hem. Hemgel and Verga were still at it for a long time calling each other names and threatening to destroy each other. The spiders noticed that there was some kind of noise and a wobble in the web. Several spiders headed toward the source of the annoyance. The girl listened as Verga and Hem figured out their relationship. The lion called out to Rafa. The young man told the girl that he was going to get them out of here and told her to be careful so the Hevelings wouldn't see them. The girl looked at the young man in surprise. She thought he had no plan. The boy replied, he needed someone to distract the Hevelings. It's part of his plan. The girl noticed how a hole had formed in the cocoon the lion was in. The hole grew in size and the lion was able to climb out of his cocoon. The young man had a knife in his hand. The young man used this tool to free Rafa from the cocoon. He acted quickly and skillfully. The young men freed themselves from the cobwebs and saw the hevelings approaching them. The young people jumped to the ground. The girl could not hold on and fell down. The spider got close to Hem and Verga. The warriors stopped all movement. They were silent. The girl got to her feet and said it was hard for her to move yet. The guy said it was okay. There were weapons near the young men. The guy told the girl to choose the one that suited her. The lion said he would distract the bugs and the girl would free the others. Rafa asked how he would do that. The guy wondered if she wasn't paying attention. The laws of physics don't work here. The young man jumped up and hovered in the air. That must have been why the stones were in the air. Rafa saw rocks, lion, and hevelings tumbling through the air. The girl asked what physics was. Rafa decided that she was distracted. Never mind the physics, we need to free the others. The girl released the red one. He jumped to the ground. Rafa told him to get himself a gun and help her if he wanted to survive. The girl asked Virga if he could stand. The warrior said he could do it, and he thanked her for releasing him last. Virga leaned on the girl's shoulder. She helped him move around. Rafa said she was waiting for the Hevelings to run farther away. She also doubted that if she had released Virga sooner, he wouldn't have left him alive. Hem looked away resentfully. Verga said it offends him. He is a practical man. Hem is a great meat shield, the girl thought. And so did Verga. Red asked how many Rafa had managed to free. The girl said she counted 18. Verga thought, to defeat three Hevelings, that's even more than enough. Hem said there were more than three already. And suggested that everyone look in that direction. Red and Lion engaged in battle with the Shevelings that had come up. The insects were very fierce. Rafa shouted that the Hevelings were coming. Rafa shouted that the Hevelings were coming. The girl noticed that someone was in danger. One of the warriors pressed his back against a rock. The Hivelin was coming at him, moving its fearsome jaws. Rafa sprang at the bug, swung her sword, and brought her weapon down on her opponent with a scream. 
the girl chopped off one of the beetle's legs, and thus drew its attention to herself. The warrior immediately ran away. The girl shouted for him to help her, and now she was a target for the heveling. The warrior, without stopping, ran further away and shouted that he had a family back home. Rafa was left alone with the hewling. Rafa had to fight alone. She was thrusting her sword into the body of a huge beetle. It was very hard. The bug managed to throw the girl far back. Rafa dropped her sword in flight and landed far away from him. The girl made sure to get close to her sword. She had to hurry. Rafa held out her hand. It was still a little ways away from the weapon. The bug grabbed the girl and was about to sink its jaws into her. Rafa screamed. The bug's jaws were almost near the girl's face. Rafa screamed in fear. Tears showed in the girl's eyes. She screamed, help. She didn't want to die like this. The next moment, the beetle loosened its grip and the girl was able to break free of it. She did not understand what was the matter. Then she saw Lion, who thrust his spear right into the eye of the terrible insect. Heveling fell to the ground, struck dead. The young man managed to save Rafa at the last moment. The guy apologized to the girl and said he was almost late. And apologized. Rafa looked gratefully at the young man. He had just saved her life. The beetle kept moving. It was agony. The lion wondered if it was still alive. The guy climbed on the hewling again and continued to finish him off with his spear. The girl watched it with bated breath. In her eyes, Lev was a very courageous and brave warrior. At some point there was a crunch and something burst. The girl clenched her eyes and put her hands out in front of her. The guy continued to maul the insect which was thrashing in agony. The beetle stopped moving. It lay in a pool of its own blood. The lion had finished the insect. The lion left the bug alone and rushed to the girl. Hem was next to her. Lion asked how she was. Hem took Rafa in his arms. She was senseless. Hem told Leo not to worry. He helped her. Lev asked how she was feeling, if she was alive. Hem replied that she had fainted and her arm was broken. But on the whole it will do. The lion said cheerfully that he seemed to owe their crazy goddess again. Hemgul said the lion was getting too soft. He doesn't usually take care of goblins like that. Lion said he had his reasons. He asked Hem to take care of her while he helped the others. The young man was about to leave when Hemgul called out to him. Levo stopped, turned around and said he didn't have time. Why is Hem distracting him? Hem said Lion, the leader, and he, the fighter. So the guy can take care of her on his own. The lion hefted Rafa onto his shoulders and told the departing Hem, and not to blame the young man if he died here. Hem replied, telling the boy not to worry. He would definitely come back. Hem repeated that he would definitely come back, but only after having a good time. The fighter saw a huge hewling standing in front of him. A huge beetle was killing its prey. There was blood everywhere. Nearby lay one of the Greyborn. There was blood all around him. Many warriors stood in front of this heveling. It was a huge evil monster. The warriors were with weapons and ready to strike this evil monster. The girl looked at Hemgul carefully. The girl called out to Hemgul. He asked what was the matter, shaman. Why she was not using her magic. The girl said she tried. But this berserker was blocking her way, and she pointed her finger at the red one. Red shouted his name is Drog Grimerson. He is the son of Milk, champion of the Western Hills, and the Hevelings will die at his hands. Hem pushed the red man aside. Hem shouted to the girl to begin her magic. Drog called Hem a treacherous fool, and said he had no right to do that to him. The shaman girl began her incantations. She said, O oh, great guardian of the heavens and seas, hear their prayers too. Grant them your grace, so that they may crush their enemies. With that, the girl threw the pendant she had on her hand towards the heveling. The pendant struck the insect and exploded. There was a bright flash. Hem looked at it and said it worked. The bug survived. Hem's been working out how much power it takes to destroy that thing. Guess we'll have to do this the old-fashioned way. The warriors pounced on the heveling with their axes. With an unquenchable desire to take down the monster, the beetle was very strong, and it wasn't easy to defeat him. Hema didn't succeed the first time. The warrior worked his axe and shouted curses at the heveling. He was doing his best. Something happened to that monster that really surprised Hengel. Drog and Hemgul exchanged pleasantries and continued the battle with the heveling. The two warriors stood shoulder to shoulder. Opposite them was a huge beetle that moved its terrifying jaws. Its eyes were burning. The beetle saw them as dainty prey. Hem shouted to the red man to go around to the left, but he didn't finish the phrase in time. Red shouted that he was Draw Grimerson, son of Milk, and so on. At that, he pushed Hem away and moved forward. Hem shouted what he was doing. The insect pushed the two warriors away from him with its paw. They flew a good distance away. The lion calmly watched this clash. The young man reached for his spear and decided he had to come to the rescue. 
Then the boy put the spear aside and thought he could do little to help now. So he decided to wait a little longer. Rafa coughed and began to come to her senses. The girl rested her head on the young man's shoulder. She seemed to be asleep already. Lev thought, when this is over we should find a healer. Lev looked at Rafa and thought, shattered arm, several broken ribs, concussion. He'd given her Talmic root to make the pain go away. But he could not delay in finding a healer. The young man remembered Hengel's words, something about him being too soft. He didn't usually take care of goblins like this. The guy hoped that after everything that had happened, she would treat him better. Although he doesn't know what's on her mind. Heveling couldn't be defeated. Everyone ran away from him in a hurry, including the son of Milk. Shaman asked Sean what it would take to finish the thing off. Sean replied that she had no idea. Drog was running away from the bug, but there was anger in his eyes. Drog continued his record, that he was Drog Grimerson, son of Milk. The girls shouted that they knew, and motioned for him to be quiet. The warriors decided to try to drive the bug into the cliff. They decided to stand over the precipice, and as soon as it starts to accelerate, they will scatter to the sides. Perhaps the insect will die after the fall. Drog, the shaman, and Shan stood over the abyss, with their backs to the cliff facing the hewling. A stone hovered nearby. The monster came closer and closer to the warriors. The huge jaws of that monster were already very close by. The shaman asked, and what should they do now? Heveling opened his mouth. He was ready to swallow someone. The warriors looked at the insect with horror. They had nowhere to retreat. Suddenly along with the rocks, Hemgul flew past. It was very sudden. Where did he come from? Hemgul came to his senses and wondered where he was. That Heveling hit him and he lost consciousness. The warrior saw his companion standing on the edge of a cliff, and in front of them, a huge Heveling. Heveling got almost close to his opponents. They stood in close proximity to the cliff. They were in danger on both sides. The situation was hopeless. Hemgul began to think quickly. We must help our friends immediately. Where's the axe? Where's the axe gone? The warrior realized he had to improvise, but something had to be done right away. Hem turned his attention to a rock flying by. It might help him, he thought. The warriors could already see the saliva oozing from the insect in anticipation of easy prey. The beast was at arm's length from them. The insect roared, and the shaman squinted, covering herself with her hands against the odor coming from the monster's mouth. The next moment, the hewling was hit. A huge rock landed on his head and crushed it. The girl opened her eyes and saw something she wished she could see but didn't expect it. A dead heveling lay before the warriors. He had his paws spread out in all directions. On his head was a huge stone that had broken his head. The blood of this terrible insect was everywhere. Just then the red man came to his senses. He grabbed his axe, reminded him what his name was and whose son he was, and started smashing that hewling. Shan said, I guess the gods must have saved them. The shaman looked up. There was a sound coming from up there. The girl saw Hemgul approaching them, jumping from rock to rock. The girl realized who their savior was, and where that stone had come from. Red climbed onto the defeated Heveling, raised his axe upward, and shouted, letting him know whose son he was. Everyone saw Leo running up to them, carrying Rafa, who was unconscious, on his shoulders. Red pointed his finger at Leo and said, Look everyone, the coward has shown up. At the same instant, Red received a powerful back kick from Hemgul. The warrior said angrily for the wretch to watch his tongue if he cared about his life. That young man and that girl had saved their lives. Sean said it was like that. If it weren't for them, everyone would still be sitting in cocoons until they turned into food. Drog must show the utmost respect. Drog once snapped at Shan and said that she should be in the eastern lands and groveling before the pink-skinned. Sean said that he didn't grovel before anyone. Before that, he was a gladiator. And even before that, he was the lord of the seas of Adoros. Red continued to get smart and said that the only lord he had was the invading pinks. Sean said if all decks behave like this one, they will be lords for reds. Drog said a unique thing. He is one of a kind. Drog Grimerson, son of Milk, champion of the Western Hills. The future chief of the Dragma tribe. Would anyone dare challenge him? Sean stopped paying attention to the red man and quickly walked over to Lion, who was holding the girl on his shoulders. The young man asked how she was feeling, if she was alright. Lion said he put a splint on his arm, but it didn't seem to do much good. He asked the shaman for help, but she said she didn't have the strength to heal. Sean said he could help, he has experience in treating broken bones. The lion thanked him for his help and asked what his name was. The young man introduced himself. His name is Sean Kafar. He is the cheese of Kafar Ramun. The young man bandaged his arm very professionally, putting a new splint on it. 
the lad said he was willing to do him favors. And he called the young man a lion liberator. The young man said he could just be called Leo. Lev asked if it was true that he used to be a sailor. He wouldn't mind hearing stories about his adventures sometime. Sean said he'd tell them when they got out and have a drink. Sean asked if the lion could hear the sounds. Red continued to shout. He declared that these lands would belong to him and his name would be akin to the names of the gods. Virga told him to shut his mouth. Virga pointed his finger upward and told everyone to look. Everyone paid attention. There was a huge colorful butterfly flying overhead. It was of incredible size. The lion looked at her and said, wow. The body of a defeated hiveling lies on the edge of a cliff. His torso is damaged. The Greyborn's arm emerged from the Hewling's torso, and there was a cry. Someone got out of the Hewling's body to the outside. He said there must be something here he could use. A man found someone's bag. There was something glowing in it. The guy got excited and said, bingo. He was a young man who looked just like the lion. Somebody told him he was still stealing. The guy turned around to see who had called out to him and asked who it was. Herm was sitting on the dead heveling. He said hello to the young man. Herm stared at the guy and asked, is his name Lion? The lion looked at him and said, and that's you, Herm. Finally decided to show your face. Herm said that Lion has been active lately. Lev agreed and said that was the reason they were still alive. Lev said he doesn't steal. He's just not used to sitting idle. Herman asked if that meant that Lev had put him to sleep. Lev said, yes, to keep him out of the way. After all, there is still a lot of work to be done. Herm said, he knows. After all, they have memories in common. Lev said if Herm knows everything, then why does he complain? Herm said, because Lev is dangerous to the people around him. Lev wondered what he was talking about. He wondered if he had forgotten how he had gotten here. A butterfly circles between the rocks. The butterfly has huge claws. It appears to be a predator as well. Virga points his finger somewhere deep inside the cave. The lion looks there too. Many huge shevlings are approaching the warriors. The lion cries out that danger is coming. Everyone must come together. Everyone starts pushing the body of the dead heveling to the cliff. The lion orders everyone to get inside. It's disgusting, but it has to be done to survive. The few remaining warriors push the body to the very edge of the cliff. The living hevelings are close at hand. The body of the dead monster flies off the cliff, all the warriors clinging to it. The hevelings are too late. The body and the warriors fall down. Hay and Virga are holding onto the shell of a flying insect. That should help them escape and cushion the fall. Lev said he remembered. Herm said they didn't even argue with him. They just did it because they believed in him and his plan. The lion replied, they knew he would make the right decision. So they followed him. There weren't really any other options. Herm said they followed him precisely because of faith. Even Virga believed in him. They know what he's capable of. That's what makes him dangerous. Lev looked at Herm in surprise. What was he trying to say? Lev asked if Herm thinks he's so dangerous, what does he propose to do? Herm has access to his memories, and he knows what will happen if he doesn't get in the way. His people have no future within the walls of these caves. Herm said for the young man to just get them out of there alive. And the rest of his plans were better off abandoned. The lion said, the Greyborn need to become strong, rise to their feet and go forward. Otherwise they will be finished. These people need to learn to control their own destiny, or they will be slaves for the rest of their lives. Lion said he may not have been born a scarecrow, but he will die a scarecrow, and he has no intention of dying a slave. If Herm doesn't like his ways, he can go back to sleep. A scream came from somewhere off to the side. Lion said there was someone there and shown the crystal. The lion began to look to see where the sound was coming from. The sound came from the monster's body. The guy found the girl there. Rafa started to come to her senses. The guy tried to free her. Herm asked, is the girl hurt? She's no worse than before. She is still under the influence of the medicine, and the heveling's carcass absorbed the blow. Lev wondered why it was just the two of them. Where had everyone else gone? Shadows of Red and Greyborn showed up. Leo pulled Rafa out and sat her down near the wall. The girl was still unconscious. The lion announced that he had found food and water in the other sacks. True, there wasn't much left. There were no signs of life in the neighborhood. Herm asked where everyone had gone. Lion said there are two ways to get out of here. Avoiding hitting the huge deep holes. Or you can go the other way. There are tracks both ways. Herm wondered why they had split up then. What had caused it? Lion shrugged and said he didn't know. But in any case, they would have to choose which way to go now. Lev tried to bring the girl to her senses. Herm assumed that they had split up to explore the area and should be back soon. 
then they should stay here. Lev asked if he heard any sounds. Herm said he hadn't heard anything, and asked where Lion was going. The Lion said Maria. Maria, it's you. Herm catches up with Lev, asking what he's doing. Lev says he's going after Maria, and asks him to wait. Herm catches up with Lion and says it's a trap. You shouldn't go there. Leo says he has to, and he won't change his mind. The Lion is very dangerous. He remembers slitting the bald man's throat. As the priestess said, he would henceforth be known as the Lion Liberator. He remembers standing at the barricades he set on fire, waiting for his opponent's warriors. Recalls executing his rivals by cutting off his head. The young man thinks he can end it here and now. If he lets him go, he'll be free. They'll be free. How he hugged Gorza and promised that no matter what happened, he would always be her brother. Like ordering Fulker to hand out drinks to everyone because they deserved it. As he promised to make the world a better place in the future. Promised it to everyone. Herm decided that he was lying. He couldn't trust him. Mary calls the lion to come with her. She asks him to follow her. Leo asks where Brutus is now. Maria looks around and says Brutus is waiting for them. At last they can all be together. And Leo doesn't have to fight anymore. Leonard repeats, no more fighting. Maria, hugging the young man, says that Leo made it through. And it's all over. They had brought him back to her. It was time to rest, Lev says. What about the scarecrows? They need him. Maria tells Leo that she and Brutus need him. Maria and Brutus are his family, not them. Maria says, look, Brutus is waiting for them. Brutus calls for Leo. He asks what he expects. Lev walks hesitantly behind Maria. Maria says she is so glad. She has missed him so much. Just a little longer and they will all finally be together. Lev repeats together. You can see the confusion in his eyes. Lev sees Herm appear between him and Maria. At the same moment, Lev gets hit in the face with a fist. Herm shouts to Lev to wake up immediately. He wants to bring the young man to his senses. Leo looks at Herm and Maria in surprise. His gaze clears. Maria says they need Leo. Lion closes his eyes and says it's all a dream and wants her to get out. Maria's outline is changing. She begins to sprawl and Lev says, let's go. Lev comes to his senses. He tells Herm that it is time for them to go. The lion is standing in his protective helmet. Now he understands why the Hevelings didn't follow them here. They're afraid of it, whatever it is. Herm asks where we're going now. The lion tells him to get out of here. He'll go far away. Maybe we can find Virga and the others. Herm asked why Virga specifically. Lev replied, because that thing uses their closest people to fool them and lure them in. Now think about who Virga is closest to. Herm said he understood everything. The lion called out to Herm and looked him in the eye. Herm asked what he wanted. Lev said he was grateful to the young man for believing in him. Herm replied, for he too must help. Lion said from now on, if he does anything wrong, let Herm tell him. Keeps an eye on him and helps him. The young men struck hands, it was a firm handshake, Lion said. Now he wanted to know where the others had gone. He walked down one of the roads, carrying Rafa on his shoulders. The lion stopped for a break. He looked at his reflection in the water. It had been hours, but they still hadn't found anyone. The young man thought maybe they were going in the wrong direction, or maybe they had already gotten out. Virga Hemgal, Rack and the others speculate. Virga says the ancients once left behind several shrines. They work like portals. If you enter a shrine, you can travel to another one on a different level. Rack asks, then what's the point of their expeditions? The shrines can only teleport a few people at a time, and after that you have to wait for them to reactivate. Also, in the first three levels, the shrines were destroyed by the Jira before they realized how to use them. Rack says they didn't know what they were doing. Lev says, it turns out that the nobility kept them secret so that they could safely return from a failed expedition if anything happened. Virga says that's exactly what it is. If someone is stuck on a level, they should look for a shrine. It's the best chance of getting out. Near the lake is a Chichan with water. There is a crystal lying next to it. If they teleported, so did their food. Rafa woke up. She called out to Leo. The girl asked where they were. Lev told her not to make any sudden movements. She had not recovered yet. The young man said they were in the lower levels. Lev complimented. He really didn't know where exactly. They got here after the Heveling attack. The girl saw a container of water at Leo's place. She said that she was very thirsty. The lion replied that it was water, but there was one thing. The water in the vat was clear, clear and inviting. I wanted to drink it so badly. Lev said he's not sure if this water is safe to drink. Anything can be unsafe here. The young man asked the girl how her arm was. Does it hurt? It's a temporary bandage. The girl said her arm was numb. 
Lion stated when Shan was making the bandage, he put herbs on the wound. That should make it not hurt as much. They would have to be patient until they could find a healer. The girl cried. She said that Bulgu would not spend money to cure her. If she was lucky, she would be thrown into the harem pit. It would be better for Leo if he left her here to die. Lev told her to leave that talk alone. He would be sure to find a healer for her. If Bulgu doesn't want to pay for her treatment, he'll spend the credit himself. Either way, everything would be fine. The girl looked hopefully at Leo. He wasn't joking. There were still tears in her eyes. Lev looked at Rafa. He could tell he wasn't kidding. If he promised, he would keep his word. The girl didn't believe it. She didn't realize that it was so easy to help a stranger and to spend her own merits on it. Rafa stated if Leo did, she would do anything, even marry him. Lev was surprised to hear such words. It was said by the girl very emotionally. He asked if it was a suggestion or a threat. Rafa began to feel angry for some reason, but the blush on her cheeks told me that she was very worried. Lev said the girl was very serious. Rafa replied, life for life. It is the tradition of her people. Lev looked at his companion. He wanted to understand what the girl was thinking now. The guy says he's in. He takes her life. The lion continued, he doesn't need a wife or a slave girl. He needs her intelligence and knowledge and loyalty to him. Can she give him all that? The girl asked if he really wanted her to be his confidant and a comrade in battle. Leo replied that this was his goal. Does she agree? Rafa's tear slid down her cheek and flew down, reflecting the light coming from the crystal. The girl continued to cry. She couldn't calm down. No one had ever talked to her like that before. Lev didn't know what to do. He wanted to reassure his traveling companion. The young man became nervous. Rafa couldn't resist and drank the water from the vat. The thirst was stronger. The young man yelled for her to stop. What is she doing? The water might be poisoned. Rafa put the vat on the ground. What's done is done. The girl said it was her vow to the young man. Before the gods, she promises to serve him faithfully. If she dies, it will only be to serve him. The young man looked at the girl with wide open eyes. He had not expected to hear such a thing. It was sincere. The guy took a container of water and did the same thing. He drank that water. Rafa yelled for him to stop. Why is he doing this? The young man finished the water, put the vat upside down, and said it was his vow to the Lord. If they die, they will die on the same day. The young men looked into each other's eyes in silence. There was a crystal between them that emitted light. The girl sat silent, her cheeks flooded with her abundant blush. She thought it looked like a wedding ceremony. The young man saw that the girl was blushing and called out to her. Rafa immediately came to her senses. Lev asked how she was feeling. What happened to her this time? It was because she drank the water. The girl hesitated a bit and said she was fine. She was just thinking. The young man said the water must not be poisoned. Then we must have plenty of it for the journey. And it's time to go on our way. Rafa asked where they would go now. Does the young man know the direction of travel? The guy said he'd try to find the thieves and the food. Maybe they'll find help. The young man angrily added, If they fail, they will take revenge. The young people were walking along the shore of the lake. There was a sparkling crystal at the bottom of the lake. The young men stopped. In front of them lay a dead goblin. He was holding something in his hand. There was a pool of blood around him. Lion and Rafa stopped. The young man crouched down to get a closer look at the body. He said it looked like they weren't alone here after all. Rafa asked what could have happened here. Lev said he doesn't know yet, but he would try to figure it out. The young man looked somewhere in front of him. The boy saw a stone lying nearby. The boy saw a stone lying nearby with some hieroglyphics on it, the meaning of which he didn't understand yet. The young man decided to take a closer look at them. They were three signs. He had to try to figure out what they meant. The lion said he would try to figure out what had happened here, and he added that at his command the girl should quickly jump aside. A drop of dark liquid flew near the girl's ear. Her eyes were frightened. She asked in a whisper to Leo, he above them. The young men stood with their eyes down. They didn't move. From above, two eyes glowed out of the darkness, directed at them. The lion said that on his command they would jump to the side. The young man pumped to make the girl jump. There was a tremendous rumble. Something fell from above. Shards of stone flew apart. The girl asked fearfully what it was. The young man looked closely and said what he thought, that it could have been Drog. Cheese, son of milk. When the dust cleared, they saw Drog squatting in the very place where the young men stood. The young man said it wasn't Drog, but what was left of him. The warrior had dark spots instead of eyes, from which blood gushed. Drog said in a low voice that they had called for him, 
but he had not come. The voice continued. They were offering him perfection. Drog had sprouted thorns on his back. It was a terrible sight. Drog kept telling the young man to join them. Drog grew to an incredible size. Rafa asked if he had always been like this. The lion replied that the creature made him this way. Drog got up and moved towards the warriors. Rafa took the young man's hand. She was frightened. The girl told the lion to run away. The boy stated that he was not running away from danger, and he wasn't planning to now. The girl, seeing the young man's serious intentions, shouted that he was crazy. Drog continued to approach the young men. He told Leo to join them and then he would know tranquility. Suddenly something from above fell right on top of Drog. The young man grabbed the girl and said that they must now run away urgently. Rafa shouted what was happening. The firewood ignited at the same moment. The fire spread all over his body. He was like a huge torch. Drog screamed and began twitching his arms and legs, his entire body engulfed in flames. After running a safe distance, the young men stopped. They watched the red light burn out. The girl asked how Lev knew. The guy answered, when they were examining the body, he saw a scarecrow hunting sign nearby, which means ambush, and purposely stayed still so they would hit the target accurately. Out of the shadows came Virga and the others. The warrior said that the lion had made a wonderful bait, Virga continued, though he questioned whether or not he should leave the sign. Though he realizes that it was still a wise decision. Virga regretted that battles with monsters were not difficult now. Their vulnerability to fire gives them an advantage. Lev asked if there were many. Virga replied that it was the last one they knew. They were attacked as soon as they reached the bottom of the abyss. Virga continued, they were fleeing until they learned how to fight monsters. The lion thanked them for leaving him behind. Virga replied, they had no idea where the lion was. And that was strategically sound. Lev replied that he had no doubt that this was the case. Not surprisingly, Virga was unaffected. Lion saw Hem's bag in Hem's hand. He said it was his. Hem agreed, but said it was missing a couple of flasks. The young man looked into his satchel and said that the flasks must have gone to a good cause. Hem stated that they were indeed glad to find the young man. Lev replied that Hem was not very convincing. It was probably only because he was still alive. And he asked Hem what happened. Hem and Virga looked at each other in silence. The lion realized that something had indeed happened. The young men looked around. There were some images on the walls. The shaman said they found this while they were looking for the shrine. Rafa declared that it was amazing. The girl looked around. She was shocked. She hadn't expected to see such a thing here. Rafa saw that there were a lot of rock paintings. The drawings showed the Greyborn riding the Hevelings and fighting the goblins. The shaman said it surprised her too. Scarecrows and Hevelings fought together against goblins. How was that even possible? Chance said that art is subject to many forms. Perhaps these are someone's dreams. The lion asked Hemgel if they had found the sanctuary. The warrior replied that they did not know. There were many more mysteries ahead of them. Hem pointed lion to the wall drawings and said they were hoping maybe the young man could help them. Huge golden doors appeared in front of the warriors. They led to another room. Leo and Rafa were amazed at what they saw. The young man asked if they had studied these doors. Virga said they looked all around but they couldn't get it open. There must be some kind of opening mechanism. The lion stared at the structure. An idea occurred to him. The boy touched the doors with his fingers. Gleb found himself in the dark. He could not understand where he was. He wondered what it was, where he was. A huge giant with glowing eyes appeared before the young man. Leonard Arend Vanderstein. I've been waiting for you, he said. The expedition continues on its way. The Grey carries the chair on which Bulgu is reclining. The warriors are armed. The area is strangely lit. The warriors walk in silence. Their faces are focused. The expedition is moving towards its goal. One of the goblins is fetching the rest of the water from a container. Someone shouts to him to leave some water for him. The goblins are talking to each other. One says he drank it all. It was the last flask of water. The other suggested he borrow some from the boss. The goblin said that the boss is the one to blame for everything. There's a shrine on every level. Why do they have to go back on foot? His interlocutor contradicted him, if he were Bolgu. Would he want to return to his father empty-handed? We need to collect as many glowing crystals as possible. The goblin was hungry. He asked if the boss could use the shrine to get them food. It was his fault they were left without supplies during the attack. The interlocutor said they are back to the point that Bolg needs money to pay his debts when he returns home. The boss doesn't care what happens to them. 
otherwise he would have provided them with water and cooking oil long ago. The goblin wondered if the greys still had supplies. The interlocutor said that at least some of them did. The goblins watched the greys eat the food, but they decided that their lives were far more important than the lives of the greyborn. After all, they are shamans. The expedition will die without them. The goblins said that the greyborn owe the goblins everything. We should force them to give them their supplies, and if they didn't agree, we should show them who was in charge. Before the goblins could speak, someone behind them grabbed them by the neck with both hands. The young men were startled. It was cancer. The guys backtracked and said they didn't mean anything by it. Rack continued. They know what, they need heveling bait. And I think he found a couple of them just now. The goblins were frightened and cried and said they would not do it again. They said it out of hunger. But they didn't mean anything by it. Volker said that Rock had better let them go. If the goblins found out, they could be in trouble. One of the goblins said it was better to let them go. Otherwise Rack might be in trouble. The goblin liked that argument. Rack thought for a moment and let these young men go. He didn't want any trouble. Rack took away the goblins' amulets. He said they couldn't use magic without it. If they behave well in the future, maybe he will give them back to them. The warrior looked threateningly at these goblins. They had lost the will to argue with this commander of the Greyborn. Rack let those goblins go, turned to Volker and said, he came to agree to his offer. Volker replied that they could not join Rack's unit. This is his final decision. Rack said that even their own supplies were running low. The other squads had long since run out. Now was not the time to be heroic alone. Volker repeated, they can't, they have to wait, they have their commander. Rack says he wants Hemgul back too. But he gave his life to save Rack, just as Lion gave his to save Volker's. May their sacrifices not be in vain. Volker lowered his eyes and apologized. He doesn't change his mind. Rack said it was his choice. Just don't let him forget that Virga's men are hunting for supplies too. Volker said Oswald's in charge now, and he's not gonna let that happen. Ruck distancing himself said, let's hope Volker is right. The young men looked after the departing Rack. They did not accept his offer. They will wait for their commander. They hope they will meet the lion. The expedition continued onward. It was getting harder and harder to move. Many had run out of supplies. Water was running out. The warrior girl stopped and looked ahead. She had made a new decision. The girl said goodbye to her fellow expedition members. Further, she continued to move on her own. The girl moved across the field along the path alone. The unknown awaited her. At last, the girl warrior saw a rock in the field on which a lone Volker sat. The girl approached the young man. The boy, without turning around, asked how the patrol was. The girl replied that they had seen more deserters than hewelings. Volker said sadly that he too would like to escape. But that is not possible now. The girl asked, and what would the lion have to say about that? Volker replied that Lev would have understood him. Lev always said that one should act reasonably. The girl said that Lev made Volker his right-hand man for certain reasons. Volker has to believe in him. And in himself. Volker said quietly that Jem had a lot more experience than he did. The girl said Volker's people believe in him. She heard what they said. The girl continued. People trust Volker. That's why there are no deserters in their squad. Volker countered. There are no deserters because they have more supplies. When they run out, then there will be deserters. The girl said sadly. Then it would be just the two of them. Volker came to his senses and apologized to Vara. He hadn't meant to offend anyone. Vara said Volker still had people left. She asked him not to give up something he might regret later. The young man agreed and said he was a spineless slug. Now he is trying to gather his thoughts. But it is very difficult for him to do so. The girl said that her commander always said that you should concentrate on what you can control. And if something is out of your control, don't waste your time. Volker said her commander was smart. The girl, smiling, said he was smart when he wasn't drunk, but that was rare. Volker asked what the girl was holding in her hands. Vara said that Volker looked very upset, so she brought him a flower. The young man took the flower and exclaimed joyfully. He had not expected such a thing. The boy was very touched. Volker, in a burst of emotion, hugged the girl and thanked her. The guy pressed Vera against him and repeated thank you very much. The girl was very confused. She had not expected such a violent reaction. Volker let her go, turned around and ran off shouting, thank you very much. The guy was very shy. The girl whispered, always welcome. She was very embarrassed. Her cheeks were flushed red from the rush of feeling. Volker gathered his squad around him. He had something to say, and he said he wanted everyone to listen carefully. The guy showed the seeds of a flower he got as a gift from a girl and said he needed them to find those seeds. Jem said they're on duty now, and it is necessary to hunt the heavings. Gul added that Jem was right. They won't be able to look for seeds. They need to set up camp first. 
Volker said. There must be some way. Vara suggested asking the other scarecrows for help. Maybe they could help. Out of solidarity. The girl asked if it might be a matter of them not wanting to look. Jem replied, it's not about whether they want to or not. No one is going to help for free. Volker said that it should be done by all means. Jem replied that in payment for their help, they would ask for their supplies. And there wasn't much left. Volker replied that in any case they would not have enough supplies to return home, so they should ask other leaders for help. Jem replied that Volker is the boss now and he makes the decision. The warriors stopped near the body of the dead Heveling. They decided to make a small break here. Gul decided to carve something out of wood. He did it out of sight where no one could see. Jem turned his companion's attention to what could be seen ahead. The youth surreptitiously carried away the cooking vessel from the tent camp. The young men built a fire and set this utensil on the fire. Volker said he thought it was done. He asked Jem to pass him the salt. Everyone watched the young man with interest. Jem handed over the salt and told him to hold it carefully. Because it was very heavy, so he wouldn't drop it. The girl yelled out what Volker was doing. The young man poured all the salt into the cauldron. Volker said when he was a kid, his mom saved salt. Every time they had more salt than they needed, she set it aside. And when it was Zia's day, his mom would pull out all the stockpiled supplies and cook them in a big pan. Volker continued. As the pan heated up, his mom would add seeds and small lumps of dough to it. And food was cooked on salt. The seeds were heated, swelled, popped, and popcorn appeared. And the children ate this food with pleasure. They always liked that kind of food. Volker scooped up a handful of popcorn and offered it to the girl. Vara tasted it and was amazed. It was delicious. She had never tasted anything like it before. Volker's squad happily ate all the popcorn. Someone called out to the young man. Ghoul said that Volker would probably have to cook more. Volker turned around and saw many standing hungry warriors watching them. The young man smiled and said, that's why he asked to bring more. Volker taught how to make popcorn. And all the warriors, having gathered the required number of seeds, cooked their food on the fire. Volker thanked Vara. The young man was grateful to the girl. The girl genuinely wondered why. She hadn't done anything. Volker said the girl reminded him to be realistic. He was afraid to make the first step, but she helped him a lot. The girl said that she was pleased to hear this from the young man, and she is grateful to him for these words. The young men turned around. A warrior approached them and asked if he was interrupting them. Volker saw Ruck walk up to them. He congratulated the young man. He said that thanks to him, they had a lot of food now. Volker countered that there isn't much food to eat, but this method will allow them to cook seeds and other foods they can't cook without oil or water. And this method will help them get home alive. Rack said that Lev was right to choose Volker as he was. Volker said he doesn't like Rack, and he doesn't trust him. But today he remembered that some things you just can't do alone. The young men shook hands and decided that the allies should join forces until they reached home. It was a mutually beneficial decision. Suddenly a warrior came running in, telling the boss that something had happened. The boss asked what was wrong. Rack was surprised, and he wondered what else could have happened. Why the warrior was so agitated. The warrior began to whisper something in Raku's ear. Volker thought something was wrong. Rack turned around and walking away said, looks like they made an alliance just in time. Ruck claimed that Haima's sneak attacked and killed Oswald. That's sabotage. Volker thought that meant they could be next. Well, friends, I don't know about you, but I like this manhua. The plot itself is quite interesting and intriguing. So if you liked the video, then subscribe to the channel and write a comment about what you liked. If new chapters of this title are released, I will definitely make a continuation. All the best, see you soon.